Honorable Judge Oscar Hell Jr. presiding. There's a little doctor up here. We're here for the jury? Go ahead and bring the jury in, please. There's a doctor up here. What happened? Looks a little darker over here. Something missing? There we go. Thank you. I couldn't see my. Yeah. Good morning. We have our witness, Mr. Oh, yeah. Your Honor. Yes, sir. You may proceed. Yes, sir. Uh, Ranger Salinas, my name is Joel Perez. This is Raymond Fuchs, and we represent Mr. Ortiz here to my right. Um, you testified that you've been a peace officer 29 years? That's correct, sir. And uh, when did you join the Webb County SO? Back in 93. Okay. And you said you were there four years with them through basically 97? Approximately, yes. And is that when you went to DPS? Yes, sir. And then you went to this uh, uh, Joint Operations Center? No, I joined DPS and then I went to CID, then the Rangers, then I was assigned to the Joint Center. Okay. So, so when did you become a Ranger? In 2011. Okay, so you've been a Ranger now, uh, you know, Approximately what, 11 years? That's correct. And what are your duties as a ranger? Uh, our primary duties is major criminal investigations. Uh, we assist other local, state, and federal agencies with their investigations, border security, public corruption investigations. In your career, um, how many investigations have you conducted? Might be in the thousands. Okay. And uh, how many interrogations have you conducted? Might be in the hundreds. And searches? As well, in okay. the hundreds. So when you entered into um, the interrogation room, do you remember that? Yes, sir. At some point you asked Mr. Ortiz if he, if he was willing to give a statement. That's correct. And he said no. 
I believe so. Okay. And you still pr proceeded to go forward? I still read him his rights, yes, sir. Okay. And so, uh, again, no means, doesn't mean no to you? It depends on the context you're using that. Well, you asked him, do you want to talk? And he said no, basically, is what happened, right? Yes, he said okay. no. Um, now, as the interview progresses, um, you know, he's not cooperating with you all, right? He's not being truthful, no. Okay, in your opinion, he's not being truthful at the time, because at the time, I mean, the only information you have is from Erica Pena, correct? Correct. Okay. And uh, as, as you're going forward, uh, number one, when you first entered the interrogation room, it was 321, right? I believe so. So he had already been there like an hour, maybe close to an hour? More or less. And uh, you met with Officer Calderon, with uh, Captain Calderon, to kind of figure out a strategy? Correct. Talk about what we had so far. And so you, like Captain Calderon, have experience in interrogation techniques, correct? Correct. So with interrogations, how many interrogations have you uh, conducted? It must be in the hundreds. Okay. And you'd agree that, that based on your training and experience, you have a technique? Uh, the only technique that I've been taught, sir, is uh, build rapport with the individual I'm talking to. Well, when you go to, how many classes have you gone to regarding interrogations in your career? Several. Okay. But I imagine, it, and is it a, a one-hour class? Is it a, a one-week class at a time? What is uh, it? It depends. Okay. So I'm sure they don't, they don't tell you. The only technique to utilize is to build rapport. They don't teach you that. That's the only technique I've been taught. Uh, I'm sorry. That's the only you. technique I've been taught. I'm so sorry. I was kind of speaking myself. I didn't hear you. That's the only technique I've been taught to build rapport. Okay. And so you and Captain Calderon decided to try and figure out a rapport that you had with this uh, Mr. Ortiz, correct? Correct. Okay. Now, when he was in the, uh, in the room uh, waiting for you all to go in, uh, that was by design? No. Okay. And... Uh, you know, time is passing, and the prosecutor brought up several things, which is uh, that it was Mr. Ortiz that brought up the picture. Do you recall that? Yes. That was Mr. Ortiz that brought up, uh, don't break down the door, don't ransack his kids' uh, rooms and all that. Remember? Yes. Okay. Now, regardless of the fact that he's the one that brought it up, you don't have to say, yeah, we'll do that for you. That's by design. You could have said, no, we're not going to get you a picture. No, we're going to do whatever we have to to get into that house. You could have done that too, right? We could have, but we didn't. But you didn't. And it's by design because, as you know by reading this, uh, by listening to the tapes, it's part of a quid pro quo. Isn't that true? Uh, no, sir. Okay. So you're trying to... Uh, say we're doing this for you but you're not doing this for us you recall on different occasions you say things along those lines you were calderon uh vaguely yes sir okay and so uh we say hey we've done this for you we've done that for you and but you know you're not you're not cooperating basically and you recall that doing that right yes okay and uh that involved several things uh, number one, a lot of time has passed because what time was uh, Mr. Ortiz placed into the uh, interrogation room? I would have to look back at my notes. Uh, if I told you around 2.30, a little bit later than that, would that be accurate? Uh, more or less, yes, sir. Okay. And then you all walked in at 3.21. Do you recall that? Yes, sir. Okay. And so then it's, it's until roughly 10.55, almost 11 o'clock in the morning, uh, when you all have been outside and they've taken, I think, uh, at this moment, is when they've taken, uh, I think it's clothing and the like, and then you all will walk back in. Uh, and I'm just trying to refresh your memory of where I'm at in the, in the questioning, in the, in the interview. Uh, by this time, all those things have come up, the picture uh, and the not, not breaking the rooms and stuff like that. You agree with me? Yes. Okay. 
Now, uh, <clears throat> at some point, we know that the elected district attorney of Webb County uh, is at the substation <coughs> prior to 1055 uh, on September the 15th of 2018, right? And Mr. by that I mean Mr. Isidro Alaniz. Do you recall that? Yes, sir. Okay. And um, what did you discuss with Mr. Alaniz uh, at the time prior to entering the interrogation room at 1055? I don't remember talking to him at all. Okay. So did he, was he just strolling by and you happened to see him and then you went to Mr. Ortiz and say, hey, the DA is here? I knew he was there. I don't know if I saw him or uh, Captain Calderon informed me that he was there. And was he there for another case or for this case? He was there for this case. Okay. And it's your testimony to this jury that the elected district attorney of Webb County is at a substation. You and Captain Calderon are the lead investigators. He is there for this case. You two are there for this case. And you're telling this jury that you just happen to not talk about the case. Is that what you're telling these 12 people? No, I said that I saw him earlier. Okay, and what did you discuss with him earlier? No, I just saw him there. Okay. And so that's why I'm, I'm asking you. That morning, on September the 15th of 2018, when the elected district attorney of Webb County, Mr. Isidro Alaniz, is there, and he's there for that case, you mentioned that, you and Captain Calderon are there for this case, and you're telling me that the elected DA and the two lead investigators just never happened to talk about the case. They just strolled by each other. Is that what you're telling these 12 people? Yes, sir. I just saw them there. Okay. Um, but regardless, you took that opportunity then to go in there and after what maybe seven hours or more uh, that's when you walked in there and you tell uh, you, do you have the transcript up there with you yes okay and I'm, I'm on I'm on page 13 of this uh, this six am I right yeah Okay, I'm sorry, I'm on disc uh, 6, page 13, line 17. Are you there? Uh, 13, 17, yes, sir. Yeah, and, and that's where you say, look, look, partner, everything, everything so far that you've talked about and everything that you've asked, we've accommodated you. And you're talking again about the quid pro quo. You are trying to give him things, the, the picture, whatever the case might be. Okay, now, half the district attorney's office here, he's here, he's right here. The DA himself, okay? Answer, okay, sir. And then your question, and now is the time. If you want us to put in a good word in for you, you need to, do you see where you say that? Yes, sir. Okay, and now this is you talking, not Calderon, right? Yes, sir. And so uh, you agree with me that if it's a conditional word? No, sir. I wanted him to tell us the truth. In exchange for something, I agree with you. In exchange for something, right? No, sir. For a good word to the elected district attorney of Webb County, the man that would control Ortiz's fate. Do you understand that? Uh, no, sir. Okay. We always but, confer with the district attorney's office, and they often ask us if they're being truthful with what they're saying. Well, I mean, you said you didn't talk to Mr. Alaniz, right? No, I said on, we confer on a regular basis. I didn't say that I talked to him on this case. Okay, but you see that the, I'm asking about the effect and overcoming an individual's free will. When you say we want to put in a good word with the DA if, and the if is you cooperate. You understand if he, that? If it's truthful, yes. Okay. Now, uh, you go on further, and you say again, and again, you're not talking about Truthful. You're talking about cooperation. Now I'm moving to page 14 to line 5. Are you there? Yes, you sir. See that? And, and you say you, 
this is Captain Calderon. You could be. We've com we've com cooperated with you. We've talked to your wife like you've asked us to. So again, you are implying to him that you've given him things, and you're asking for things in return. Cooperation. You see that? The only thing we were asking, sir, is for him to be truthful. I'm just saying if you saw that, because it doesn't say, are you being truthful? No, I, I saw what you... Objection, Your Honor. He's being argumentative. I'm asking him questions, Your Honor. It's cross-examination. Please that last question. Okay. But you see where... You didn't say anything about be truthful in there. You see what I'm saying? Calde not, I'm sorry, not you. It was Calderon. Calderon is saying, we're giving you things. Give us cooperation back. Do you see that or you don't? I don't see that, sir. Okay. I don't see that. Uh, Calde Captain Calderon. Well, I just asked you if you saw that or not. Yes, sir, I saw that. Okay. Now, uh... If you go to line 17 of that same page, and this is Captain Calderon, uh, uh, and you s a question by Calderon, and she wanted answers, and we told her that she could hear from you later. We asked her to go back to San Antonio, and she went back to San Antonio. Um, you're asking us for a picture of your family, and we can get your picture of your family. We'll work on that. So again, you, you haven't done that. You're telling him we can do that, but it's it's if he cooperates. You see that the, the effect it's having on another individual when you're doing that. Uh, sir, I see it as building a rapport with the individual. Okay. Uh, well, on the other hand, you could have told him we're not going to talk to your wife. Nothing stopped you from doing that, right? Nothing stopped us from okay. doing that. Okay. So nothing in this interrogation room from the both of you, Calderon and yourself, you know, Ranger Salinas. It's by accident. It's by design. You agree with me on that. It's good law enforcement tactics, right? Uh, no, sir. I call it building a rapport. Okay. <clears throat> Do you see on, on line uh, 24, again, Calderon, same page, page 14. And I'm, it's going to move on to page 15, but... Uh, Calderon question. We asked for permission to do it. He's talking about the picture. We can work on getting you the picture. And normally, normally they don't allow stuff in the jail. But I can work on trying to get permission for that dude. You see again where uh, there's there's a quit. There's a promise. But the implication is the pro, the quit pro quo to get get something back. You see what I'm saying? Or you don't see that? Again, sir, that's uh, building rapport with that okay. individual. Okay. Okay. Uh, and then on line 8, this is you speaking, uh, Ranger Salinas, on page 15. Uh, and you didn't want us to break down your door, and we're not going to break down your door. We're not going to ransack your house. Uh, everything is in the future. You, you, things that you're going to promise him to do if he cooperates, because right now he doesn't have the picture, right? I don't recall what time uh, he was given the picture. Well, I mean, we know right now it's 10.56 in the morning, right? Correct. Okay. You haven't searched his house. No. So technically, in his mind, you could still go break down the door and ransack his kids' rooms. You see that? Okay. He doesn't know what the defendant was thinking. He's dead. But the point is... This event hasn't happened. You're still telling him you can do things for him in the future. You see that? Sir, I, I see it as building rapport, building trust with the individual. Okay. By promising him things. Building trust. Building trust. By promising him things. Building right? rapport, sir. I understand that. I understand building rapport. But do you see that you're telling him you're going to do things for him? Do you agree with that? Objection, Your Honor. That's been asked and answered. I'm still examination. I'm going down the line, Your Honor. Well, I'll allow that <coughs> question again. I didn't hear you, Your Honor. I'll allow that last okay. question. You, you have asked it a few times already. You see that it's a continuum. You continue to promise things. You see that? All I see, sir, is trying to continue building rapport with the individual. Okay. Now, uh, now, if you go down to line 14 on page 15, and again, I'll wait till you get there. Page 15, line 14. 
You see, you see where it starts. Help yourself. Yes, sir. Okay. So now it's Calderon speaking. Help yourself. Help us. And with what with what happens, and we'll get you that picture. Now you see there that that is a quid pro quo. Give us something, and we'll give you something. You see that, right? Again, sir, I still think it's building rapport. Uh, look, we, you can answer that, and you can keep on just saying that. But my question is to you: This is simple English. Objection, Your Honor, he's being argumentative. Well, Your Honor, I deserve an answer. No, no sidebar. Just ask the question. Okay. Simple English is sidebar. Do you see there, in a simple English, where you are promised, you all are promising to do something, if he does something? Do you see that, or you don't? I can't see how he would. That's mischaracterization mischar of. What he's been discussing. The word promise. Well, I'll, I'll let him answer. I can give an answer. You may answer. I can't say how he would interpret that. Okay. Now, now if you go down to uh, page 16, line 23. That's where Ortiz brings up the part about his wife keeping the retirement money, right? Yes. Okay. And then if we go to page 17, and I'm going to see who, who's speaking here. I think it's still Captain Calderon. Cal Cal Captain Calderon ceases on that, and he says on line 4 of page 17, I, I, you know what? I don't know, but I can find out. You know that. That's stuff that we can work on. Again, something in the future, right? That's what I was trying to get out earlier. If she needs if she needs help after this, you see how Calderon is again promising to do something for him in exchange for cooperation. Again, sir, I, I still think this is If you don't see it, you don't see it. You can say, no, I don't see that. I don't see it, sir. Okay. Now, uh, Now, if we go to line nine, again, it's Calderon, and there's a way that, that you could help her, help us cooperate. You see that, like, that's a direct request to cooperate, and then you'll help his wife. Do you see that Calderon is saying that, Ranger Salinas? Objection, Your Honor, that's a compound question. I'm not sure what it is that he's asking. Do you see where Captain Calderon is telling him he'll do something for him if he cooperates. Here it's literal. Do you see that, Ranger Salinas? I see he mentioned the word cooperate. Okay. Um, and again, just to, to make the point, And it goes on and on. I mean, I already, we already spoke to Captain Calderon. But do you see that you talk about the retirement, you talk about the picture, you talk about the ransacking the house, and everything is if, if you cooperate, it's conditional. You see that. I still see this building rapport with the individual. Okay. And in different places you say, help us out, cooperate, right? Correct. Okay. Now... We go back now to earlier in the day. Uh, you received a call from Trooper Hernandez about uh, Erica Pena, correct? Correct. And then you and Captain Calderon at some point are at the substation with uh, Miss Pena, and that's when the bolo goes out based on the things that she mentioned to you for the White Dodge and for Mr. Ortiz. Is that accurate? Uh, the bolo went out after we confirmed the residence. Okay. 
And then um, at about 1.30, uh, I think, uh, maybe 1.15, you get the call from either, I think, Bradshaw, a trooper Bradshaw, that they've located the truck at the stripes at, there at uh, Jefferson and somebody in the is, is that correct? That's okay. correct. Okay. And then you arrive, uh, according to your report, uh, approximately 1.30 in the morning. You recall that? Yes. Okay. Now, by, uh, according to your report, and if you need to refresh your memory, I'll show you the report. Uh, at approximately 1.34 a.m., four minutes later, you say, I utilized a sign Nikon D7100 digital camera to obtain several photographs. Do you recall that? Yes, sir. So, when you arrived, the truck, the, we're talking about the white Dodge, what is this truck, that vehicle was already seized by law enforcement? No, sir. It wasn't seized? No, sir. Okay. So, uh, could I have gotten you, anybody driven away with it, or it was seized? No, sir. There was a, a trooper standing guard in it with it or near it. Okay, so, I mean, nobody could have just driven away with it, is what I'm telling you. No. No. Okay, so for, and you're a law enforcement officer, for Fourth Amendment purposes, that vehicle was seized. There was a seizure made. He's asking for a legal conclusion. Yes, so he knows about the Fourth Amendment, Your Honor. For, for, for your purposes, you know what a seizure is, right? Yes, sir. Okay. That Dodge was seized. You had a trooper there. It was seized. Yes, Your Honor. Again, that's a legal conclusion. Okay. Now, well, at 134, you felt comfortable enough to go and open the doors and start taking pictures, right? Correct. After I had shined the light inside. Okay. And just to make sure, when you say you shined the light inside, you, you, you use your flashlight to look inside, and there's something called plain view, right? You're familiar with plain view. Yes, sir. And plain view basically is that anything that you or anyone could see uh, from any vantage point is proper, right? It's in plain view. If you look into my car and you see a coffee cup and, and my sunglasses, well, it's in plain view. You could, you could look at it as a law enforcement officer or any citizen to come by my window and look at it. It's in plain view, and that's proper, right? Right. Okay. Now, you went further, and then you manipulated the truck by opening the doors and conducting a search. Objection, Your Honor. It's a compound question, and he's injecting uh, stuff, uh, facts. facts that are not in evidence. Did you open the door to the truck? I did, but I had probable cause. Okay. At 134, now you're saying you had probable cause. The moment you were opening the door, was that truck seized by law enforcement? Yes. Okay. So the minute you're going to, before, the one second before you open that door, that truck was seized by law enforcement? Yes. Correct. Okay. Now, you're going to manipulate, you're going to move stuff. That's you have no evidence of that. What's, make your objection. Okay. You manipulated the truck to be able to see things that were not in plain view. Is that correct, sir? Objection, Your Honor. Those are facts that are not in evidence. He needs to ask him if he, if he manipulated anything. I just asked him if he opened the door. He said yes, Your Honor. <coughs> I'll allow the question. Over. The, okay. At some point, after you seized the truck, did you open the door to the truck? Yes, sir. And we have the photos where you open the driver's side door. Yes? Yes. Sir. Okay. And now is where <laughs> the gun is in the uh, door well, if you will, of that, of that white Dodge Ram on the driver's side. And we have the photo. I didn't see the gun at that time. Okay. Now, you testified earlier that when you saw the holster, which we know is between the 
driver's side seat and the center console, you testified, you immediately notified uh, the SWAT team, right? Correct, the people that were about to search. And because you were concerned about officer safety. Correct. Okay. Now, there's nothing inherently illegal about someone having a holster for a firearm in a vehicle. Not in those, in normal circumstances, no. No, let's say in the plain view. You look in, at any person's vehicle in plain view, and you look inside, and you someone has a holster for a gun. There's nothing illegal about that, right? There's nothing illegal, but not at those circumstances that I was looking at, and the circumstances surrounding the event. Okay. Now, you're so concerned about that holster <coughs> that you immediately notify the SWAT team, right? Correct. Okay. Now, you are opening the doors for this truck. And, okay, you have been an officer, you said, 29 years. Is that accurate? Correct. You are not only a DPS trooper, you are within the DPS, the elite of the elite, the best of the best, a Texas Ranger, are you not? That's an opinionated question, sir. Okay. Now, Officer safety is paramount to you, is it not? Yes, sir. And so you open that door because you want to know if the gun for that holster was in that truck. Isn't that true? No, sir. Okay. All your experience that you have, officer safety is paramount, and you're telling these 12 people that the reason that you opened that door is not because you wanted to know if the gun was in the truck. No, I saw the holster and I radioed in to the guys that the guy might be armed. Okay, and that gun is plain as day once you open that door. Do you know that? I didn't see it that night. <laughs> okay, and you're saying you didn't see it because we know that DPS Trooper Santuro turned in that inventory form and he said no inventory was conducted. You're aware of that now, right? Yes, sir. Okay. And so if a Santuro said back then at 217 in the morning on September the 15th of 2018, that's when he signed that form or documented it and he says no inventory conducted. You, you're aware of that form? Yes, sir. Okay. So now you're stuck because once it says no inventory was conducted, the only remaining thing is a search was conducted. Isn't that true? A search was conducted. It, is it true or not true? A search was conducted. Objection, Your Honor. That calls for a legal conclusion. Jesus, Judge. What Ooh, was the conclusion? There was a, the question about whether there was a search? What is the objection? The objection is that he did not know what Santoro had that night. He's asking if he knows now. Was it a search? That's the last question that, he, that, that was asked. That was the question, Your Honor. And it's a compound question. Did, did you hear my question? Rephrase it at this point. Yes, Your Honor. Okay. If it wasn't an inventory search, I mean in, an inventory, then it's a search. The vehicle is wasn't that searched. True? The vehicle was a search at the stripes. You understand that once you start moving stuff, that's a search. Objection, Your Honor. He's mischaracterizing the evidence. He has not said that he moved anything inside the vehicle. Your Honor, the officer can say no. He can either say yes or no. This is cross-examination. I'll allow the question. Murder. Ask the question. Okay. If it's not an inventory, and we've, con we've already talked to these 12 people and all of us, an inventory is to document things that are in the truck, right? Correct. If you wanted to do that. But then we know now that no inventory was conducted, right? No inventory was conducted at that time. Okay. But yet, you manipulated that vehicle in order to look into it. Objection, Your Honor. Again, he has not asked him if he's manipulated anything in that vehicle. 
And his answer just, was no. He, he asked, did you move anything? Just rephrase the question, sir. Did you open the door of the truck to look into areas that were not in plain view? The areas I was looking at were in plain view. Not where the gun is. Objection, Your Honor. He's arguing with the witness. Not where the gun is. How do you see the gun? But you open the door, and now things that were not in plain view are viewable by law enforcement. I didn't see the gun, sir. Are you, uh, Exhibit number seven. Can you just, that, that's been admitted into evidence so you can testify. Do you see where the door to the white Dodge on September the 15th of 2018 at the stripes in Laredo at Jefferson and San Bernardo has the door open to it? Yes, sir. You opened the door. Yes. You took a photograph of that gun. I didn't see that gun at the time. <laughs> Do you see it now? I can see it now when you're pointing at it, but I didn't see it at the time. Okay. And you knew there was a holster. By the time you opened this door, you knew there was a holster in the truck. Yes, sir. Okay. And you're testifying to this jury that you weren't opening the doors because, in fact, you were looking for a gun. No, sir. Okay. And you've been a, a cop 29 years. Yes, sir. Uh, and we know that uh, Trooper Santuro said there was no inventory done. Correct. Out at the stripes. No inventory. And we also know that uh, there wasn't any need to be concerned about the truck because you instructed Santuro, number one, to secure the truck at 1.15 a.m. You instructed him to secure the truck. Correct. Okay. So we know it's secure. We know it's seized. And we also know that once it was going to be told, according to your reports, you instructed Santuro to follow the wrecker all the way to the uh, substation, right? Correct. Okay. So we know that nothing was going to happen to that truck. No one was going to get into it and search it or take stuff out because it was being followed by law enforcement all the way to its destination. Correct. Right? Okay. So, any items that were in there were secured to begin with. Would you agree with that? Yes. Okay. Now, once it gets to the substation, um, we know that Ortiz was arrested around 2.30 a.m. We've established that. Now, around 3.54 in the morning, you instruct Ugarte Nenke to go ahead and start searching the truck. Do you recall that? Yes, sir. Okay. So, now out at the scene, at the stripes, because the truck was already seized, other than inconvenience and the like, nothing would prevent you from getting a search warrant for it, right? I didn't need a search warrant. Okay. But if you had wanted to, nothing would have prevented you from doing it. Probably the time, probably the time at night. Okay. So time, but I mean, legally, is what I'm asking you. Legally, you could have gone, done an affidavit, and gotten a search warrant and searched it out there at the stripes, right? Uh, not at the stripes. Okay. Let's go back now to the substation at 7209 Saunders, there in Laredo, at 354 a.m. We know the truck got seized and transported A 
it have to be after 134 because it says, I instructed Sergeant Santoro to escort the wrecker and the Dodge to WCSO Webb County Sheriff's Office substation located at 7209 East Saunders. So we know that we, it, it eventually got to, to the substation, right? Correct. Now, once it's at the substation, you'd agree with me that that's a secure area. You could say that. Well, it's not a bank vault, but it's, it's, a, it's an, an enclosed area where law enforcement personnel are allowed to go in only. Would you Correct. agree with that? Yes? Yes. Okay. So we know the truck's not going anywhere. Correct? Correct. Okay. And at that moment in time, uh, nothing prevented you from going to go get a search warrant for that truck. Legally. Legally, but I still have probable cause and I had abandonment of a vehicle. That, that's not what I'm asking you. My question is, legally, could you have gone to a magistrate, presented your affidavit, gotten a warrant, and then come and search the truck? I could have. Okay. Uh, but you did? No, sir. Now, at, three, at 354, um, you instruct Ugarte to start searching the truck. I don't remember what time I, I told him. Okay, her. let me see. Okay. Uh, I'm going to show you what's been marked as defendant system number eight, and this has been admitted into evidence. And this is, uh, can you tell me what that is? This is a general evidence log, uh, collection log. Okay, can you look at number one? If you can read it. You want to put on your glasses? Yes, it's uh, 354 AM. Okay, and what is, what is the item that is logged in? One HK 40 caliber handgun with one magazine, nine live rounds. Okay. And... And can you read out what item number two is in the time? With the numeral two. Yeah, that one. Uh, 4 a.m. Cash bag with makeup and syringe. Okay. Okay. So now, uh, I'll ask you again. So by 3.54, you instruct uh, Ugarte, Deputy Ugarte, to begin searching the truck, the white Dodge, right? Correct. And uh, at some point, uh, well, we know before 10.55 in the morning, at some point as Ugarte is searching the vehicle and gathering items, uh, you are either looking at them or gaining possession of some of the things, right? I never gained possession of any of the items that was collected. Okay, do you recall Calderon uh, taking possession of some of the items? Yes. Okay, and the items he got were the, uh, the bag with the syringes and the like, right? Correct. And uh, at some point, uh, you all also looked uh, I guess by ejecting the magazine of the HK to see how many rounds were in it, right? I didn't. I don't recall that. Okay. Do you remember going in and at some point talking to Mr. Ortiz and asking him why are there rounds missing from your magazine? I don't recall that either. Now, with regards to the bag, because you remember that. Yes, right? sir. Now, you need the items in the truck to be able to confront Mr. Ortiz uh, with, let's say, incriminating evidence. Is that is that accurate? That's fairly accurate. Okay. And, for example, uh, when you told him, we know this bag is not your wife's because it has syringes in it. Remember? Yes, sir. So, 
you're utilizing the items from the truck to because they're necessary to assist you in the uh, in the interrogation. You agree with that? I wanted him to have as much information as possible to make it his own conclusion. Sure. And uh, I'm just going to tell him, you know, if I were to just tell you just generally, because it's in the transcript somewhere, and we've all looked at the video, that at some point, either you or Calderon, I know you don't remember right now, but if I were to tell you that they say, hey, why, why are you missing rounds from your magazine? And he even replies, because I shoot up from the air sometimes. Does that refresh your memory? Yes. Okay. So we know that that did happen. You all, based on the search of the truck, beginning at 3.54 a.m., uh, were utilizing the items obtained from the truck to assist you in the interrogation of Mr. Ortiz. Correct? Again, we were providing as much information to him so he could make a good, good judgment as far as what he was going to tell us. Okay. And the truth of the matter is you didn't obtain a search warrant for that truck that day at that time because it was more important to you to use those items to incriminate Mr. Ortiz. Isn't that true? That's not true. to the entire events that night regarding the search of the White Dodge on September the 15th of 2018. Isn't it true that the reality is that you searched it out at the Stripes and then you searched it over here at the substation without a warrant because you needed that information to incriminate Mr. Ortiz. That's not true, sir. Ranger Salinas, I'm going to direct your attention to State's Exhibit 116. Do you remember who brought up the district attorney uh, first? Was it Mr. Was it you who brought up Mr. Alanis being at the at the station, or was the first time Mr. Alanis's name was brought up? Was it by Ortiz? Mr. Ortiz. I think it was Mr. Ortiz. I'm going to direct your attention to CD3. Page 
on page 50. And he says, did you guys already wake up the, ch up the chilo? And it continues on page 51. <coughs> District attorney already and tell him that you had one of the two stranglings. And you answered, uh, this is Agent Salinas, well, nobody told you it was this way. And look how I am. Ha, this is him answering. Ha, I mean, you answer, well, you know that you're, you're there for a reason. And his answer is, so you guys haven't even told the media, guys? I don't know. I don't believe that. And your answer is, we have it. But somebody, someone else did. You know how BP works. What happens the first time that you get a load or something happens, everybody is there taking pictures, sending emails. We just have something like that. I'll be the first one that, the gossip, but that's not us. And he says, uh-huh. And it keeps going and he's discussing how it's, how BP knew, and he's actually goes into uh, discussing the text messages or the media messages that were being sent back and forth while he was in the back of the truck when he got apprehended. Do you recall that? Yes. So who is the person who first brought up Mr. Alanis? Mr. Ortiz. Now, you were questioned uh, and you, uh, defense counsel said that you were not seeking, that you never asked said that you were seeking the truth. Do you recall that he just asked you that? Yes. I'm going to refer you to, it's on disc 3, page 19. And this is by Captain Calderon. It starts on page 18. And he's discussing, she has kids, she has an, uh, she had an alternative to wait, a way to support them, but it was still a way to support them. She was supporting the family, he's referring to Melissa, uh-huh, uh-huh, is that okay? The answer, no. Look at Melissa, he's reviewing a photograph. Look at Erica, reviewing a photograph. Shit, I don't know, I don't know what you guys want me to tell you. The answer is, I want you to tell us the truth. And he says, I'm telling the truth. <coughs> Question, I'm, I'm asking you for the truth. And his answer is, I'm telling you the truth. So you did tell him that you wanted the truth. Yes. Did you not? Now, on disc six, which is, Later on in the interview, page Salinas. And you say, okay, the question was, okay, if you help out, Ortiz, and this is you speaking, if you don't want to waste money on legal fees, because he was discussing that, why are we going through all of this? Just tell us the truth. You know. <coughs> Did you... You already know the truth was the answer by Ms. Ortiz. And then Captain Calderon says, well, you know that, J.D. And the answer was, you already know that either it's on me and you've got blood on my boots. And the question, J.D., look at me, please. Did you also discuss the word truth? Yes. At any time in that interview, did you use the word promise? 
No. Words like, uh, we will accommodate you, were used? No. Would you, uh, do you recall uh, Captain Calderon saying, I'll ask permission to see if we can take that picture? Yes. It's, is that different from, I'll give you a promise? Yes. Guarantee. Is that a guarantee? We're going to have to leave questions, Your Honor. We're <coughs> Was there, as he put it, a quid pro quo? No. Was there anything guaranteed? No. I'm going to object to leading questions. Overruled on the last question. Now, during uh, your interview, uh, and we discussed this when we had you on direct yesterday. You said you already knew he was a law enforcement officer. Once he was at the substation, yes. Yes. And do you recall him discussing times that he had his own investigations and that he would conduct uh, interrogations and searches? Yes. And arrests. And arrests? Yes. So you knew he was familiar? Did you know if he was familiar with these uh, concepts and the practices of Arrest, search, and seizure? Yes. And interrogations? Yes. Did he ever ask for an attorney? No. Did he ever stop talking? No. <coughs> Did he offer to did he authorize consent to go into his home? Yes. Did he authorize and give you consent for DNA? Your Honor, just leading questions, Judge. It's direct, opening the questions. I'll, I'll, I'll another question. Yes. Did he, did he provide his PIN number or password for his phone? Yes. And what was that for? To get his picture. Did you take a GSR on him? I did. Now I'm going to uh, refer your attention to uh, the the stripes that you were questioned on whether it was a search or not. <coughs> At this point, uh, hold on, just a moment. you know after you had been you had spoken to Erica what was the uh, complaint that she had made what criminal uh, uh, offense had she committed well, compound question Rephrase. what criminal charge had she complained about aggravated assault and uh, unlawful restraint and what yeah. information did you gain from her uh, that you already knew would be connected to her statement the uh, white Dodge truck, okay. Mr. Ortiz, the uh, tallies, and the uh, pink, uh, small little flowered purse. Okay. And what did she complain he assaulted her with? With a handgun. Okay. So those are the things uh, that you knew would be connected to the aggravated assault that Eric Peña was complaining about. Is that correct? Correct. Your Honor, at this time, we'd like to publish State's Exhibit 23. It's already in evidence. You may.
people. Will you explain what's going on in here? Who is that? That's me and uh, Sergeant Santoro. Had you been in, had you opened the doors of this vehicle yet? No. Okay. What is it that you're doing right now? I think I'm on the phone. And who's that other individual? That's Sergeant Santuro. Okay. And what are you doing now? Going to the driver's side door. With what in your hand? A flashlight. And what are you looking for? The, uh, I'm looking what's inside. Okay. And what do you see? The holster. Okay. What else do you see? Uh, it didn't come out, but I go on the driver's side, or the passenger side, and I see the tall boys and the pink purse, and another brown purse in the front doorboard. on the phone when you saw the holster? Yes. Okay. And what did you advise? That I had an empty holster that the subject might be armed. Okay. Have you opened the doors here yet? No. Now at this time, uh, you saw, uh, what were the items that you saw in plain view? A brown purse in the front. A uh, pink purse in the bag with some tall uh, beer can, tall boys, and the empty holster in the driver uh, driver's side. Did that match what Erica Pena had complained about? Yes. Mm-hmm. And and uh, er, when you testified during direct before, did you conduct? Did you move any items in this vehicle? No. Did you remove any items in this vehicle? No. Did you manipulate anything? No. Did you believe that you could search the vehicle at this time? Objection, Your Honor. Uh, Speculation, opinion, and as they objected, uh, it's a legal conclusion, Your Honor. Rephrase. Would you... Where would you... So, what would be the ideal location to conduct a search? At a, a more secure place. Now, when you were prompted, or what prompted you to take photos of the vehicle? Just so I can document the contents in, in the pristine manner that they were. And, and when you took the pictures, you did not. You can go ahead and turn. And when you took these pictures, again, uh, it, it was just what you could see in plain view? Correct. Okay. Uh, but you. Do you recall looking at your pictures and yesterday, and it was a picture that you had taken, and in fact, on the door, the gun was there? Correct. So even though the camera picked it up, your eyes did not pick up that camera? Correct. I mean, that gun? Correct. So what was the purpose of taking these photos at this time? Just to preserve the way the contents were in the vehicle. There were preservation photos. Correct. When you uh, attempted to open the door, was it locked or was it unlocked? It was unlocked. Did you know who the owner was of this vehicle? Yes. Okay. And was he present? No. And did you know from the investigation what had happened when the troopers <laughs> confronted him at the stripes? Yeah, I'm going to object to hearsay, and I'm also going to object to leading. 
overruled. Yes. What was that? That he had fled. After Ortiz was apprehended uh, at the parking garage at the AVA, um, do you know if they found a gun on him? No, they didn't find a gun on him. Okay. And so, did you? Did that prompt you to do anything? Uh, or inform the uh, investigators to do anything or the troopers? Yes. What did you do? I. Uh, Told him if somebody can go down to the stripes and check the bathrooms or inside the, the the store or around the area. Again, because you did not see the gun in the vehicle. Correct. There was a dumpster by that truck. Did you have them look at the dumpster? Yes. I have no further questions, sir. <laughs> That's witness. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, well, at this time, uh, you didn't know how many guns were involved, did you? Correct. Okay. And um, the DA just asked you yesterday when you saw the photo, did you see the gun? Did you hear her ask you that? Yes. And so, th am I hearing right that yesterday is the first time you see that photo and you see that gun there? No, it was when I was reviewing the videos getting ready for trial. Okay. But she said yesterday. I saw it yesterday again. So, 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 in, you're testifying to these twelve people. Objection, that matter. I was referring to yesterday's testimony. Okay. Not well, go ahead and ask your question. Well, when did you see? She referred to a photo or a video. That that's the first time you see the gun in the well of the door. Yes. And you're the lead investigator. I'm the lead investigator for DPS, and Captain Calderon is the lead for the Wood County Sheriff's Office. And you've been an officer for 29 years. That's correct. And your testimony to this jury is four years approximately after this incident. This is the first time that you see that gun in that door well. That's correct, sir. Okay. And you're going to stick to that? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, earlier she asked you... Uh, did you manipulate the truck? Did you hear that? Yes, sir. Okay. What does manipulate mean to you? To move around. Move, move anything, right? Right? Yes, sir. Did you move the door when you opened it? Yes, sir. Okay. So you manipulated the truck? Yes. I opened the door. Okay. And you took a photo of the contents of the door well. Correct. Okay. And with all due respect, I know you wear glasses, but how far were you from that gun now that you know there was a gun there? What, two feet? More or less. Okay. Uh, she said, she asked you, and you took pictures only of things that were in plain view. Do you remember that? And you said yes. Yes, sir. That's not true. That's not true, right? They were in plain view when I saw them with a flashlight. Okay. The, the, where the gun is, where you now four years later know where the gun is, without moving anything, was that gun in plain view? No. So when she asked you, did you take pictures only of things in plain view, and you said yes, that is not true. Yes, that's true. Officer, you just testified that that gun was not in plain view. I didn't, I didn't see it. I'm not asking you, you saw it. I'm asking you if that photo 
shows things that were not in plain view. Correct. So the answer is yes. You took photos of things that were not in plain view. Correct. The door, the, when I opened the door, I, I didn't see the, the guy in there. Thank you. No further Now, Andrew Salinas, when defense counsel asked you regarding uh, the first time you saw or let me ask you this first, just a moment. I want you to look at State's Exhibit 7. I mean, Defense Exhibit 7. You opened the door and you took this photograph. Correct. You also took a photograph of the front of the vehicle. Is that correct? Correct. And the back. Correct. Did you have time to look? at the details in the photograph that you had just taken. I'm to the again. No. And yesterday, during your direct examination, did you take these photographs? Yes. Before yesterday, had you been, not had you noticed this object here? No. What is this object? What does it appear to be? Let me see if I can zoom in. Upon co closer inspection of the of this picture that you took, what does this appear to be? Uh, a black pistol. What part of that pistol? The butt. But when you took the photograph, you just snapped the, the camera. Were you looking at all the little details in it? No. And because you didn't see the gun, it prompted you to do what? Just close it back up. Okay. But you saw an empty holster? And it probably let, let the guys know on the ground that it might be a uh, weapon involved. And then when they didn't have the gun, after he, they apprehended Ortiz? I instructed them to go search around the area. Okay. So it's your testimony today that when you were at the stripes, the purpose of these photos was for what? To preserve the stuff that I had seen. And also of things that you had not seen, isn't that true? Correct. It was to preserve the condition as you found it there. Correct. When you say preservation photos, what does that mean? To preserve what's there.
Any further questions? Well, that, that DPS form that you saw, that you know which one I'm talking about, right? Yes, sir. It says inventory form. It doesn't say preservation form, right? Correct. Okay. Because generally, with regards to what you're talking about, it's inventory or search. There's no preservation. Inventory or search. You agree with that? Uh, no, because... I just asked you if you agreed. No further questions. Thank you, officer. No further questions. Mr. Dunn, you're excused, sir. Thank you. The 116, was it there? Because I know he had a copy, it looked like. Does he have the copy or the, or the exhibit? 116, just make sure that the 116 is still there. I don't know who had it. You had it or the witness? Okay, just want to make sure we, we keep it with the other exhibits. And you were asking, who's, you have another witness? Today? Yes, he's accused. You're released from the subpoena. Your next witness, yes. can you raise your right hand so I can administer the oath? Do you saw me for the testimony you're going to give during this trial? The truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth will help you God. I do. Thank you, sir. You may take a step. Pause. Pause. Yes, ma'am. state your full name. My name is Sean Daniel. How are you currently employed? I work for the New Mexico Department of Public Safety. Prior to that, where were you employed? The Texas Department of Public Safety. What were your duties of the uh, Texas Department of Public Safety? I'm a forensics, I was a forensic scientist in the firearm and tool mark section. And how long were you employed at the Texas Department uh, of Public Safety as a firearm tool marks and analyst? Um, I think around six years. Um, what were your duties there with regards to the day-to-day -day work? So my job as a forensic scientist was to analyze evidence uh, related to crimes. <clears throat> what is your educational background? Uh, the um, what qualifies me for this position is my biology degree. And do you have any other education that you received, undergraduate? Um, I do. Yeah, I have a finance degree also. Um, what about any specific training you've received in the area of firearm uh, and tool mark examination? I'm sorry. Can you repeat that question? Yes. Have you received any specific training with regards to firearms and tool mark examinations? Yes, I have. Uh, when I was hired for this position, I went through a training program that was about a year and a half long. Um, we went through different, you know, modules um, with the history of the field, different manufacturing techniques, a lot of firearm safety and function, a lot of microscope work. Um, and then after that training, uh, I go into supervised casework where I'm working actual cases under the supervision of a trained examiner. Uh, and then uh, after I complete that, then I do independent casework. Uh, since then, I've done continuing education and 
Uh, this has been my job, you know, 40 hours a week since then. And at the time you were working at the Texas DPS, it was a crime lab, correct? Yes. At the crime lab, were you licensed as a forensic analyst? Yes, I was. By who? The Texas Forensic Science Commission. And just for the jury's sake, um, how many times have you yourself conducted firearm tool mark examinations? Many times. More than 20? Yeah, oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> More than 50? Yes, um, I've worked over, I've worked hundreds of cases. So it's in the hundreds then? Yes. Okay. Um, at the time you were employed at the Texas DPS Crime Lab, was the lab you were working at accredited? Yes. Was that accreditation recognized by the Texas Forensic Science Commission? Yes. And was that accreditation recognized and accepted nationally or internationally? Yes. Okay. So shifting gears here, I want to ask you a simple question. Is it possible in your field and in your science and expertise to determine whether a particular bullet was fired from a particular gun? Yes. Okay, could you, could you please explain to the jury how it is that you come to such a conclusion? What's the day-to-day, -day, you know, typical examination of a firearm and projectiles and casings? Uh, so, uh, like a typical case that I work? Like a typical case asking? you work. Uh, so, when I receive the, the evidence, you know, I'm looking at the paperwork, seeing what's being asked of me, you know, what is the evidence and, and what's being asked of me. Um, I'm going to take the evidence, I'm labeling everything, I'm documenting everything as I'm going. Uh, I take the packaging, I open it up, I see what the items are. Again, labeling them and, and documenting as I'm going. Uh, I'm going to look at the fired ammunition components. Uh, you know, what kind of bullets are they? Um, looking at the cartridge cases. I'm measuring and, and documenting different um, characteristics about them. Uh, if, if there's a with the firearm, I'm going to do uh, safety and function tests with them to see if it's safe and something that I want to uh, fire. So if I deem that it is something safe that I want to fire, I go into the, the range and I shoot into a water tank. Um, I take ammunition that is at the laboratory that we bought at the store. It's ammunition that is, is very similar to the ammunition collected at a crime scene or uh, by a medical examiner. Um, so then I'm going to test fire the firearm into the water tank. I'm going to create known samples. So those samples I know were fired by the firearm because I fired them. Uh, I'm going to take that known sample set. Uh, I'm going to compare it to itself. Uh, I've already compared the unknown sample set to itself. And then I'm going to compare the two samples together. So I'm comparing the unknown samples from the crime scene to the known samples that I test fired from the gun. I'm doing pattern recognition um, analysis under a comparison microscope. Uh, then I'll form my conclusion, I'll write my report, I'll close that case up, package up the, the evidence, and then start the next case. So you said that you'll examine and test a known sample to an unknown sample. And go ahead. That's correct. And so you're testing um, what comes out of the gun, correct? That's correct. Do you have a demonstrative on you that you can show the jury to kind of show what it is and the components that you're looking at and testing and examining? I do. Would it assist the jury in understanding what you're talking about when you're saying I'm taking measurements and looking at the size and all of that? I believe it does. Uh, Your Honor, at this time we'd ask that he be allowed to use his demonstrative to educate the jury as to what it is he looks at. It's a plastic model of ammunition. So, uh, go ahead and explain to the jury what it is you look at. And, and if you could hold it up so they could all see. Yeah. Uh, so this is, um, just to help with some terminology, this is one round of ammunition. It's called a cartridge. Um, this part right here is the projectile. This is what travels down the barrel and this is you know what you're shooting. This is the projectile or the bullet. Um, so the whole thing is not called the bullet. Usually in, in TV shows and movies and stuff they call the whole thing a bullet. 
but this part is the bullet. The whole thing, a live round, is called a cartridge. Um, this would be the primer area that the firing pin strikes, and then this is called the cartridge case. So again, the whole thing is a cartridge. This is the bullet. This is a cartridge case. So when you're looking at those and examining them with the known sample and the unknown sample, what is it on that that you're looking for? Uh, well, with the bullet, uh, whenever the bullet travels through the barrel, um, it's, it's engaging the rifling in the bore of the barrel, and it's going to leave, you know, scratches on the bullet. So that's what we're, we're, we're comparing, these marks right here. Uh, on the cartridge case, uh, there can, there's a whole lot of information on these. Uh, there can be chamber marks on the side body here, of course, the, the firing pin impression, and also this part right here uh, actually slams against the breech face during the firing process. So you get kind of like an, an imprint. And so on this part, we call these uh, uh, breech face marks or breech face impressions. And there's some other marks, but those are the big ones. So with these characteristics, um, how are you comparing them? I mean, could you explain to the jury what an individual characteristic is versus a class characteristic? Uh, so whenever I'm doing my uh, microscopic comparison, uh, the first thing that I'm looking at is called class characteristics. These are design features that are determined before a tool or, or firearm is ever made. So an example of that would be the, the diameter of the bullet, the, the caliber of the cartridge, um, the, the shape of the firing pin. So these are general features. Um, to, to give you an example of, of why they're important in a comparison, uh, if a crime scene had cartridge cases with round firing pins and you give me a gun that creates square firing pin impressions and I look at that, I'm going to eliminate the gun as firing those because the class characteristics do not agree. So I'm looking at a number of different class characteristics uh, on the cartridge cases and on the bullets. And I'm going to compare those unknown samples to the known samples, and I'm looking at those class characteristics first. And if those class characteristics, if any of them disagree, then it's an elimination. But if, if they're all in agreement, then I move deeper into my analysis and I look at individual characteristics. Those are the little nicks and ticks and the unique things to that tool or firearm. Then I'm going to do my pattern analysis on that. And if I see uh, if there's a, a significant or a sufficient um, disagreement, then I would eliminate them. If I see sufficient agreement, then I would identify it. And in some cases, I can't really tell. There's just not enough information. That would be an inconclusive uh, conclusion. So when you are able to analyze a gun and have the sufficient findings, would, would you say, is it safe to say that that's similar to a fingerprint? Yes, and, and that's a really good analogy. It, it's like the tool or firearm has fingerprints, and when you get that physical contact between the, fire, uh, the ammunition components and the firearm, it's a lot like the firearm is leaving its fingerprints, so to speak, um, on those ammunition components. And that's what I'm looking at. Those would kind of like be the, um, the individual characteristics. So in this case, did you conduct any type of analysis as you described to the jury? Yes, I did. Okay. And as part of that analysis and evaluation, did you prepare a report? Yes, I did. Okay. You want a permission to approach? Yes.
County has been marked as State's Exhibit 236. Are you familiar with this document? Yes, I am. How are you familiar with it? Uh, this is the report that I issued. Um, it okay. summarizes my conclusions of my analysis for this case. Okay. Is this was this report uh, generated in the normal course of business of the Texas DPS Crime Lab? Yes, it was. Was this report made at or near the time the events that this report talks about took place? Yes. And has this report been materially altered in any way? Uh, no. Okay. Let the record reflect. I'm now tendering to defense State's Exhibit 236 for review, and uh, would like to admit that into evidence. Assuming you're offering it. Yes. I'm offering. Uh, we'd object. Well, if I could ask a question, did you prepare this report yourself? Yes, sir, I did. Judge, we'd object to being offered into evidence. It's not a business record. It's his personal report. Okay, Just like an offense report. I mean, it's his report. Um, Judge, I would, if he wants to have a conversation, we approach the bench. Go ahead. Go ahead. evidence at this time. This would uh, it assist the jury in understanding the discussions we're about to have. If this was published, then they could follow along. I believe so, yes. Do you have permission to publish State's Exhibit 236? You may. description and results results of analysis and interpretation this list is this a list of items that you received to test and conduct analysis on yes it is okay. permission to refer to this again your name
I'll let you put your gloves on, but I'm going to ask you a couple questions while you're doing that. I'm tendering to you what has been previously marked and admitted as State's Exhibit 36. Is this an item that you received for evaluation? Yes, it is. And how are you familiar with this item? Yes, I am. How are you familiar with it? Uh, so I know that I examined it because I have my case identifier sticker uh, on the firearm. Uh, this sticker is unique to this item. It has information uh, like the, the case number. Uh, it has the agency item number, the lab item number, uh, the date, and my initials on it. So I know that I examined uh, this firearm. And when would be the first time that you saw this firearm? Uh, I would have to refer to my notes to have a date. Um, well, actually, hang on. Uh, it'd be February 11th, 2019. Okay. And what, if anything, did you do with this particular firearm? Uh, well, the first thing I do after you know labeling it and making sure that it's it's unloaded uh, is to uh, function test it. And, you know, checking all the safeties, making sure that it's functional, making sure that there's nothing wrong with it. And again, is it something that I want to test fire? Okay. And did you end up test firing it and making sure it was safe to to use? Yes, I did. Okay. Could you explain to the jury what it is that you did with regards to the test fires? Uh, so with the test fires, uh, uh, you know, after I fire them and collect them, again, the very first thing you do is you label them. Um, and then I'm going to do a comparison among the, uh, that, that known sample of test fires to see what patterns are repeating. With regards to your report, right here, item 20, and specifically 20-1. Is this, item, is this item that you received in evidence and tested the same firearm that I just showed you? Yes, it is. And with regards to this, um, was any evidence ammunition provided to your office? Yes. And what, if anything, did you do with that evidence uh, ammunition? Uh, the live rounds, uh, I didn't do, uh, the majority of them, I didn't do any analysis, any type of comparative analysis with them. Uh, two of the evidence and uh, two of the live rounds that were submitted as evidence uh, I used as test fires. Would that be indicated right here at 21-02-AB? Yes. So you received live ammunition from the Webb County Sheriff's Office and of that ammunition you used to, to make known samples? That's correct. Okay. I'm now going to show you what's been marked and previously admitted as State's Exhibit 40, 41, a 45A, and 44B. Are you familiar with these items? Yes, I am. How do you recognize them? Uh, they also have my uh, case identifier sticker on the packaging, um, so I know that I examined them. Okay. And when would have been the first time you, you've seen these items? Uh, it appears the date on them is, yeah, on all the packaging is February 11th, 2019. Okay. With these particular uh, pieces of evidence that I've handed over to you, did you test them? And if you need to look at your report to refresh your memory to make sure. I, I do. Um, do you, we can move this.
And what was your question now? Yes. Did you perform any analysis or tests on these uh, items that are in front of you? Yes, I did. Okay. On all of them? Just to be clear. Yes. Okay. Now let's see. This one seems to still have, if I'm not mistaken, um, your DPS Prime Lab tape and has been unopened. Am I correct in saying that? Uh, it, it's definitely sealed, and I see my um, where I have sealed it, yes. I'm going to have you open any of those that uh, are still sealed, and then that way we can take a look at them. Okay. You want me to open all of them? All of them. If they're still sealed, please open them. Okay. This one is open. Already? And those last this three one is open. And this one is open. Oh. So these three are open. All right. Now showing you what's been marked and previously admitted as states exhibit 44, 46, and 45. Are these projectiles that you received? Um, and tested, conducted an analysis on? Yes, they are. Okay. I've now opened States Exhibit 40 and retrieved what was in there. And I'm going to do the same for 41 and 42. Now you said these, that these were cartridge casings, correct? That's correct. But they're also commonly referred to as just casings. Yes, that's a slang term for it. Okay. Were these cartridge casings tested by you? Yes, they were. Okay. Your Honor, permission to publish states exhibit 40, 41, 42, 45, 46, and 44? Thank you. These are all items you tested, correct? That's correct. And pursuant to your lab report, that would have been item number 4-03-AA, four, uh, four a cartridge casing from scene, 4-04AA, cartridge casing from scene, 12 dash 01, one bullet from Melissa Ramirez. 12 dash 02, one bullet from Melissa Ramirez. And 12 dash 03, one bullet from Melissa Ramirez. These would co coincide with those on your report, correct? Yes, they would. And from scene, are you familiar with what scene these were taken from? I'm sorry. 
these casings? Right yeah, it's my understanding they were taken from the Melissa Ramirez scene. Okay. And after you completed your evaluation on this, these, these are what you would call, let me back up, these are what you would call an unknown sample, correct? That's correct. And then you had previously said you had two known samples from, that were fired from this firearm right here. Uh, that's correct, but I actually had uh, five <coughs> unknown samples. I, I fired a total of five um, uh, test fires. So of those five, two of them were from <coughs> ammunition that had been sent to your lab? That's correct. Three of them were ammunition that were store-bought um, that we keep at the laboratory as stock. And then two of them were evidence cartridges, so a total of five. Okay. And after doing your analysis, which I believe you said you, you do it under a microscope, right? Yes. What did you find on all of these projectiles? What was the conclusion? On, on those particular uh, items, it was my opinion that they were fired by the pistol, uh, that, that pistol right there. You just said that after your evaluation of those, that it was your opinion that they were fired from this firearm, correct? That's correct. How did you come to that conclusion? Um, so just as before when I was explaining, you know, how I analyze a normal case, you know, I'm looking at the class characteristics first, and those were all in agreement. So I go deeper into my analysis and look at the individual characteristics. Um, and again, it's, it's doing pattern recognition, uh, and when I see a pattern that has sufficient agreement, uh, then I form the conclusion that it's an identification and that the ammunition was fired by the gun. Okay. Now, I'm going to show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 50, 51. Oh, yes, I'm aware. 47. 49. And 48. And if I'm not mistaken, I believe 51 and 50 are still sealed. So if we can go, actually before that, if you could identify this envelope and tell me whether or not that was something that you're familiar with. I am familiar with both of these items. And how is it that you're familiar with these items? They have my case identifier sticker on them. Okay. When was the first time that you would have seen those two <laughs> items in particular? Uh, these items I saw on February 12th of 2019. Okay. Now, if you don't mind, could you please open them up? And for the record, they are still sealed, correct? Yes, they're still sealed. Okay. And actually, seeing where you, for the record, Your Honor, I'm going to move the um, state's exhibit sticker because I do think it lines up with where he's about to. I can cut somewhere else. Okay. Let's 
let's take a look at States Exhibit 50 and States Exhibit 51. You recognize these items? Uh, I do. Okay. Is there any uh, particular thing that you do with these to make sure you recognize the actual casings? Yeah, uh, actually with uh, a lot of the items, I can scribe them. So I take a metal scribe and I scribe the case identifiers on the item themselves. I do that with the cartridge cases and the bullets. Okay. Your Honor, permission to publish uh, State's Exhibit 51? Mm -hmm. I said you scribe, correct? That's correct. There needs to be some markings on it um, that I don't think you would see in a traditional store-bought bullet. Is that your scribing? Yes, towards the, the mouth of the cartridge case. So oh, on the model, it's it's right here. You can actually see it scribed. So, right so I put unique case identifiers, and they're scribed in there. Okay. And that would co coincide with right where this pencil tip is, correct? That's correct. Those metal scribings? Yes. Okay. So you've already said that you're familiar with 51 and 50. Now are you familiar with States Exhibit 49, 47, and I believe it's 48? I am familiar with these items. Are you familiar with those items? Uh, the, the packaging has my case identifier sticker on it, and the packaging is sealed. All right. And um, again, like you had testified earlier, there would be some scribing on it? it yeah, on, on these, on the bullets, um, it's actually a different type of bullet than this, but I scribe it on the base. Uh, these bullets have a closed base, um, but I would scribe it right here. Okay. Your Honor, permission to publish States Exhibit 51, 50, uh, 48, 49, and 47? Mr. Daniel, did you perform an analysis on all of these items? Yes, I did. And just so we're clear, these... should coincide with the report. Items number <coughs> um, 2702AB one, twenty seven O two AC one, and then twenty eight O one. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Twenty eight O two, one gray fragment, and twenty eight O three, one bullet fragment. And then just so we're clear, twenty seven O two AB dash zero one was one forty Smith and Wesson cartridge casing from scene, and twenty seven O two AC dash O one was a. 40 Smith & Wesson cartridge casing from scene. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And so you did conduct a test on all of these items here? I did. And what was your findings after you conducted that analysis of these unknown samples to the known samples you took from this H&K firearm? 
Um, so the item in the top left and the top center, uh, I didn't do any comparative analysis because there wasn't anything to compare to. There just wasn't much information on them. Uh, I'm sorry, the, which, one, which one did you not do an analysis on? So I didn't do a comparative analysis okay. on the top left item. This one? Correct. Okay. And then uh, and then also State Exhibit 48 in the top center. Um, there just wasn't enough data for me to compare to the known sample. Okay. But you did conduct an analysis on State Exhibit 49? Yes, I did. As well as 51? Yes. And as well as 50? Yes. To your knowledge, do you know uh, where these, based on the lab submission reports or anything that's in your records, where these uh, came from? Uh, I would have to look at my notes. Please go ahead and do so. Your Honor, may I refer to my notes? Yes. I do know which crime scene that came from. And which, which ones were those? Uh, the victim was Claudine Lorel. Loretta? Loretta. I okay. apologize. So these came from Claudine's scene and from her body then? Um, that's what the submission form says, yes. Okay. And um, after conducting the analysis, what was your conclusion? Uh, it's uh, my opinion that those three items, the bullet and two cartridge cases on the screen, uh, were fired by that, that pistol right there. Okay. And just to get into a little bit more detail for the jury, um, I'd like to talk about, and I know you had mentioned it earlier with regards to the firing pin, correct? Yes. Could you please tell us what it was that you found on this one, on, on this casing, and obviously the casings that you've already testified that you um, have tested, what their similarities were or, or anything like that? Uh, well, they had what we call a um, hemispherical firing pin impression, and the breech faces were parallel. And what does that mean? Uh, so the, the if you look at the firing pin impression, it's kind of like you took an ice cream scoop and scooped out ice cream. It's it's real rounded, um, not just you know when you're looking at it from this direction, but it's rounded from the bottom. It's hemispherical, um, and on the breech face, um, you can actually see it on this model. Maybe a little bit, well, maybe not, but the the lines are parallel across here. And again, this is the area that slams on the back of the breech face during cycling. And so the, the marks on the breech face are going to be parallel, and they're going to impress onto the back of these cartridge cases. And, and on not just the ones that you've already testified to, but on all of them that you tested in your report, they all had that same breech face and the same firing pin style? The class characteristics I looked at were in agreement, yes. Now I want to show you what's been marked and previously admitted as State's Exhibit 145. Are you familiar with this envelope? Yes, I am. 
Okay. How are you familiar with this envelope? It has my case identifier sticker on it. And when would have been the first time you saw this envelope? <coughs> February 12th of 2019. Okay. I also want to show you what's been marked for identifying purposes as 56A, 55A, 52, 53, and 54. Are you familiar with all of these envelopes that I've just handed to you? Yes, I am. And how is it that you're familiar with all of these envelopes? Uh, they have my case identifier sticker on them. And uh, when would you have seen these envelopes for the first time? Uh, it looks like they are all marked February 12th, 2019. All right. I want to take some of these out. You could help me with those last two. Okay, these are going to need to be open. All right, I think these last three actually will. these items from the packaging, do you recognize all of them? Uh, yes, I do. Okay, and how do you recognize all of them? Uh, they have my scribings in them, and I also uh, write the case number and ink on the case body to make it a little easier to see. Okay, and um, you did conduct an analysis of, of all of these items here? Yes, I did. Okay. Your Honor, permission to publish states exhibit 52, 53, 54, 55, and 56? Yeah. Judge, if I might, have they been admitted into evidence? Yes, these have all been previously admitted. Yes, sir. I'll verify them before I allow them. Would these exhibits coincide with items number 2402AA, 20, uh, a 16 federal cartridge, 1640 Smith & Wesson cartridge, 24-03-AA, uh, again, a federal Smith, uh, 40 Smith & Wesson cartridge casing, 24-04AA, a 40 Smith & Wesson cartridge casing, and 
Items number 2501, unknown object submitted as bullet fragment from scene, and 2502, bullet fragment from scene. Do these coincide with those item numbers on your, on your lab report? Yes, they do. Okay. And you previously testified right now that you did conduct an analysis of all of these, correct? Yes, I did. And after conducting the analysis of these unknown samples, correct? That's correct. So the known samples you took from this guy? Yes. What was your conclusion and finding? Uh, can you flip over uh, State's Exhibit 56, please, so I can yeah. see the item number? Is that 2501? Yeah. bring it back to you. Just a little difficult to see oh, the no two worries. items. So the item in the top left, uh, State's Exhibit 56, um, it wasn't, yeah, I didn't do any comparative analysis on that. Um, it just wasn't consistent with an ammunition component. Uh, I labeled it as an unknown object, okay. so not an ammunition component. So 56 was not tested then for comparative analysis? I didn't do any comparative analysis on that, correct. Was 55? Uh, 55 and the three cartridge cases. Uh, it was my opinion that they were fired by that pistol. Okay. Based on what again? Uh, again, microscopic comparison of the class characteristics and individual characteristics. Individual characteristics as well? Uh, the, the tool marks. Okay. And um, are you aware, again, just like before, where which crime scenes these came from? Uh, I am. Uh, the, my paperwork has the victim listed as Giselda Hernandez. That would have come from we said the Hernandez thing. That's yes. where these came from. And That's where my paperwork has, yes. Okay. And again, they were tested and you in your opinion said that they, they came from that firearm. Yes. Okay. Finally, I want to show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 57 and State's Exhibit 58. Are you familiar with these items? Yes, I am. And how are you familiar with these items? Uh, the packaging has my case identifier sticker on it. Okay. And when would have been the first time that you saw these items? February 12th of 2019. Okay. Now we have this one. I believe this one's still sealed, so if we can open it up, please. Do you want me to open this one also? Well, are you familiar with that envelope? I, I am. Okay. And it has my case identifier sticker on it. Okay. And when would you have seen that item first? Uh, also February 12th of 2019. Okay. Let's open it up.
Now that you're seeing this item, are you familiar with that particular casing? Yes, I am. How are you familiar with that casing? Uh, it has my uh, case identifier scribed uh, near the mouth of the cartridge case, and I have I wrote in ink what the item number was. Okay. And did you conduct an analysis of these items? Yes, I did. Okay. I want permission to public publish states exhibit 58 and 57. items came from? Uh, yes, I am. And where would that have been? Um, my paperwork uh, has the victim um, um, as uh, Umberto Ortiz. Um, I think there was a different name that the individual went by, but my paperwork has Umberto Ortiz. Okay. Janelle Ortiz? Yes. How she identified? Yeah. Um, okay, so you tested these unknown items, unknown samples, correct? Yes, I did. Which were recovered from the scene of Umberto Ortiz, also known as Janelle Ortiz. Yes. Okay. And after comparing these unknown samples to the known samples that you took from this h &K, what was your conclusion and what was your finding? Uh, it was my opinion that those two items were fired by the, that pistol. How did you come to that conclusion? Uh, same as before in any analysis we do, um, we look at the class characteristics and then the individual characteristics. I'm sorry, could you repeat that last part? I had a little bit of trouble hearing over there. Uh, we look at the individual, uh, the class characteristics, and if they're in agreement, um, we look at the individual characteristics. You said you scribe on both the cartridge casings, which is the casing left behind after the projectile has been fired, and the projectiles or the bullets, correct? That's correct. Is that the scribe you were referring to that you put on, on the bullets? Yes, they are. And, and why is it that you do that? It's to uniquely identify the item. Okay. I believe you said you also do that on the casings, correct? That's correct. Would it, and you said it would be somewhere in this area, right? That's correct. And so, again, why is it that you do that on the casings? To uniquely identify that item. Okay. And you also said you marked them with ink, too. Is that correct? Yes. Would that be the marking in ink that you left? Yes. And why do you do that as well? Uh, that's to make it a little easier for me to, to see the item number. Okay. Now, we just looked at, I believe it was nine casings, cartridge casings, which again, as you said, what's left behind after the projectile is fired, fired, correct? Yes, nine cartridge cases were submitted. Do you know what size caliber these cartridges were? Um, they were... The cartridge cases were 40 Smith & Wesson caliber. Okay. Do you know the, the manufacturer of those particular uh, bullets or cartridges? The cartridge cases had a federal head stamp on them. Could you explain to the jury, because you had said Smith & Wesson and then you had also said federal. Are you familiar with why cartridge casing, the, the maker would be federal, but then you also have Smith & Wesson, which is also another firearms manufacturer. Could you explain why it is that you have those two markings on a single bullet? Uh, yeah. Um, well, on the cartridge case, the head stamp, um, there's 40 Smith & Wesson 
uh, and that's the caliber. That's the 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 type of cartridge uh, that this is. So they make a lot of different types of calibers. They can make really small ones, really big ones, but that designates what the dimensions of this cartridge. Uh, you know, this live round of ammunition, there's standards, and when you say 40 Smith & Wesson, it has to meet certain standards. So that manufacturers, if they're making either ammunition or a firearm, and they're saying it's 40 Smith & Wesson, it has to meet certain specs. The, the diameter of the bullet, the, the, the length of the cartridge case, the diameter of it. It's so that it'll operate, so it'll, it'll chamber in there very tightly, and that it'll fire. And there's a lot of different calibers out there. So the 40 Smith and Wesson refers to the caliber only. Um, and the Federal refers to uh, who made the cartridge case. So Federal is the brand that, that just physically made the ammunition and they made it in the 40 Smith and Wesson caliber. Okay. This particular case based off of the projectiles, the bullets that were sent to you um, for analysis. Were you able to tell what type of bullet they were? Yes. What type were they? They were jacketed hollow point bullets. Do you know who that type of uh, a jacketed hollow point is commonly used by? Uh, a lot of manufacturers. And it's difficult to determine the brand of, ammu of fired bullets unless there's very specific features to them. But it, you know, they don't have like a head stamp on them like a uh, cartridge case. And if you know, are you aware as to whether or not law enforcement uses that kind of round? Uh, law enforcement uses a lot of different calibers and okay. different ammunition, yes. Okay. But the jacketed hollow point in particular? That's most common, yes. That's the most common amongst law enforcement? Yeah, I would say that's the standard, yes. The standard? Yeah. Okay. And, and so here you have where all of these uh, 40 Smith & Wesson caliber cartridges that were manufactured by Federal. I guess it was Federal that you said was the manufacturer? Are you, you referring to the live ammunition or the cartridge cases? Cartridge casings. Uh, all the cartridge cases had a Federal head stamp on them. And they were all 40 Smith & Wesson? That's correct. And all the projectiles that you tested and that you could have enough of a sample of, um, were, were those also jacketed hollow points? Uh, yes. Okay. Permission to approach you on? Conclusion. <coughs> After testing all nine 40 Smith & Wesson caliber cartridge casings, you determine what exactly? Uh, it's my opinion that the nine submitted cartridge cases were fired by the H&K pistol.
and after doing an, an analysis and evaluation on all six projectiles, which were what we learned to be fragments or bullet projectiles that came from the bodies of Melissa, Claudine, uh, Janelle, and then projectiles that were found at the scene for Iselda, what was your conclusion after testing these specific items right here? Uh, for those six projectiles, I determined, uh, it, was, it was my opinion, that they were fired by the H&K pistol. Okay. So they were all, each and every single thing you tested was fired from this firearm right here? Uh, those items I listed, uh, it was my opinion, they were fired by the H&K pistol. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Daniel, uh, my name is Raymond Fuchs. Uh, I'm just having a few I questions a for you. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm going to hire tech that I'm used to. If you could start over, please. Okay. Oh, start all over? Yes, okay. sir. I didn't hear the first part. Okay. This is, sounds silly. Mr. Daniel? Mm -hmm. Okay. My name is Raymond Fuchs, and I represent Juan David Ortiz along with Juan Pettis, okay? Uh, I noticed when you first testified about your qualifications, you stated that you had undergraduate degrees in biology and finance. Was that correct? That's correct. Okay. Just out of curiosity, what led you into guns? Uh, well, it, it really brought me into forensics. Um, I've always liked science, and I chose forensics. Uh, I entered the field when I first started. I started as a uh, DNA technician, which was a supportive role in the DNA section. But I got to see all the different sections um, you know, in the laboratory. I got to see fingerprints and drug analysis. I got to see firearms analysis, and I thought it was a pretty cool field. Um, so a position opened, I applied, and, and I got it. If, if I could approach you, uh, We're going to talk about this, this gun a little bit, which is uh, State's Exhibit 36, it looks like. I like the best right there. So I'll just set it here if you need to refer to it. Fine. If you don't, that's fine, too. That, that, that weapon itself, State's Exhibit Number 36, is a H and K Model 40 S and W, correct? Uh, the caliber is 40 Smith. And I believe the the weapon itself will have S W on it, will it not? <clears throat> I believe the model is a P2000, but let me refer to my notes. Here it has it has P two thousand on and the side. And then what? What's the rest of it say? Uh, well, that's that refers to the caliber. It says forty but, but Smith and Wesson. Yes, but sir. I mean the weapon itself has the forty S and W on it. That's correct. Yes. What type of metal is that barrel made out of? Uh, steel. Do you know what type of steel? I don't. I mean, whether it's carbon steel, stainless steel. No, sir, I don't. So you don't know how much vanadium content it might have or how much chromium content it might have? Uh, no, sir, that's getting outside my area of expertise. Okay. What type of bore does that uh, barrel have? Um, can't, I don't understand the question, I'm sorry. Okay, so you wouldn't know the difference, a conventional bore as opposed to a button bore? 
Are you referring to the rifling or? Yes, I'm, I'm talking about how the bore is created. Uh, well, the rifling is polygonal. Okay, and, and what's the difference than that? And polygonal as opposed to what other kind? Uh, well, there's conventional rifling. Uh, those are the two big ones. There's okay. also polygonal with rails. Now, now when you test, uh, you shoot a test fire, as it were, and recover that projectile. Yes, sir. And then you compare it to the ones that have been submitted to you in the laboratory. Yes, sir. What particularly are you looking for to compare them? Uh, so, uh, again, I, I'm looking at class characteristics, but I can kind of do that before I test fire. Um, and then I'm going to, um, but there's some class characteristics I do need to test fire, and that's the, the rifle, the type of rifling, and also the rifling widths and dimensions. Um, and then once the, I compare the class characteristics and I see that they're in agreement, um, then I look at the individual characteristics. Okay, and, and again, is there certain terminology for what you're looking for? Uh, individual characteristics is the uh, term like, we use, yes sir. Uh, something like landing grooves is sometimes used? Landing grooves is referred to conventional rifling, yes. Okay, but this has what type? Uh, polygonal. Okay, and, and the, what you're looking for then is it ever referred to instead of landing grooves as hills and valleys? Yes. Okay, I mean you've heard that before. Yes, I have. Okay. And, and where on the projectile do you look for these things? I mean, exactly how do you go about doing this? Uh, well, so I, I, I put the two objects up on my comparison microscope where I can see both of them and I can kind of move them around, I can magnify them, I can change the lighting, I can turn them and rotate them. And I'm, I'm looking at pattern recognition. And so I, I find an area that may have a lot of uh, individual characteristics on it, and then I rotate the other one to see if I can find that same pattern. Uh, when I find, uh, you know, an orientation that I like, uh, you know, either the pattern is really good or I can rotate it around. And, you know, I'm, whenever I find an orientation I like, I rotate the bullet around and I'm looking at all the markings and everything and seeing if everything's lining up. I could show you steps in 57. Okay. Thanks. Now, where on that did you exactly look for what you just described? So, it'll probably be easier to see on my model, um, but it would be these markings here. Uh, so, whenever the bullet is fired, it's engaging that rifling to create. It, it, the rifling's job is to impart a spin on the bullet, a lot like a quarterback throwing a football. It's to increase the accuracy and the distance uh, of the bullet. So it has to engage that rifling and get that metal-on-metal metal contact. And so th that's the area that I'm looking at. You said that you did have some projectiles you just like. Did you bring those with you? I, I did not, no. Okay. So we're not going to be able to see the, how much damage is done to that state's exhibit I just showed you compared to the normal projectile. I, I'm sorry, I don't understand the question. Well, <laughs> well, you know, I think the state is at 56, was it? The projectile uh, yes, sir. 57, yes, sir. Okay, I, mean, it, it, it's, I mean, it's certainly compressed. You're talking about the shape of the bullet? Yeah, I'm talking about how it's... Yeah, so this is a jacketed hollow point bullet. It's uh, So it's a different... Uh, style than this bullet. It actually has a hollow cavity right here and its purpose is when it hits to expand and the term we use is mushroom. Um, so this is kind of a normal shape for a jacketed hollow point bullet. Um, I did bend the, pull, the, the petals out but the, the petals much like the nose area here do not engage the, um, the rifling. It's just it's not the diameter isn't wide enough. So this is the bearing surface, and this is what I'm looking at. And so the, the, the part that you call petals is from what part of the bullet? 
So it's part of the, the nose area, and, and again, it's designed to expand out. Um, Do you know that this, uh, uh, well, the weapon we're talking about here, when we talked about how the bore, do you know how the bore was made in that barrel? No, sir, I don't. Uh, are you familiar with any of the milling techniques for barrels? Um, not, not with H and K, sir. Okay, so you don't know if they use like uh, a computer numerical control to create the bore? You know, CNC milling. I believe that the bore is made with with button rifling, but I would have to contact H uh, and K to confirm. And now you say that if you did the test fire of that weapon and compared it to these uh, projectiles that were recovered, say, during the autopsy that were submitted to you? Yes, I did a comparison. Okay. And how many of these H and K uh, 40 calibers have you examined? Uh, I'm not sure. Well, I mean, have you examined other ones? I've examined a number of H and Ks, but I couldn't give you a number. Well, and having done that, have you ever gone back and made comparisons to the other ones? Uh, no, sir, I haven't. Okay. So what we're talking about here <coughs> is a science of absolute inclusion. Once you find a match, it's game over. Is that a question? Or? Yes, it is. I'm sorry. Uh, I'm saying, is that the way it works? Well, I, I testify that it's my opinion that the ammunition was fired by the, the pistol. Well, and this is based on the training and experience that you have. So whoever trained you said this is how it works. Is that correct? Uh, well, what we did, we read research, we did tests ourselves, um, and so the, the training really establishes the foundation for the field. Do you have any idea how many of these H&K 40 caliber weapons were manufactured? No, sir, I don't. And they are manufactured in Germany, are they not? I believe so, yes. Okay, are you aware that in the United States and Germany, they use different metals to make barrels, for example? Um, I. I would have to confirm that, but you can trust me on it if you like. But and they they also use different manufacturing methods. Would you agree? Uh, that's getting into you know manufacturing, and 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 you're correct. Over time, they do change manufacturing uh, techniques. Okay. For example, Agent K advertises that the barrel in that weapon is uh, good for at least 10,000 rounds. Would you say that's a lot of rounds for a gun? Yeah. Okay. So the barrel must be pretty stout material? Yes. Okay. And there must be very tightly controlled manufacturer? Yes. Okay. And so what I'm suggesting or asking you is, you don't make a comparison of these unknown projectiles to other barrels other than the one that's submitted to you. That's correct. So you really don't know whether these projectiles could have possibly been fired from another weapon. Uh, that, that's not my opinion. Well, but your opinion is based on what your education is and what you believe. The point is you don't do these other tests so you cannot know. Well, we do. Uh, there is research out there. Um, there's a famous one where they took 10 Ruger barrels that were manufactured one after another on the assembly line, and then bullets are fired through those barrels. And I actually took that test and research, and uh, we can't. You can tell which bullet came from which barrel. So a test is given again with 10 barrels that are manufactured one after another on the assembly line. The, the test is given to us, and I scored 100% on that test. So obviously, the, the science works. And was that done with an HMK P2040 caliber? No, it wasn't. Okay. I have no other questions. Thank you, sir. Any, any further direct, redirect? I have a couple questions, if I may proceed out. <clears throat> there was talk about 
the hollow point. And I just want to make it clear what it is that we were talking about. So this is the one. States Exhibit 57. Permission to publish? <coughs> All right. So this is a jacketed hollow point round, correct? That's correct. And you said there's a thing here. There's a hollow, what was it that you described it as? A hollow cavity? Or a, how did you describe it? Uh, so it, it's called a jacketed hollow point bullet. Um, this would be a full metal jacket bullet. It has the nose is, is solid. Um, the hollow point would have a hollow cavity. Uh, so this would be more of like a penetrating round where it just kind of goes through. This would be a, like a hollow point round. And when it hits, it would expand. It's, it's designed to expand. What is the purpose and, and reason for the designing a bullet that expands on impact? Uh, so there's two kind of general reasons why. Um, one is to increase, to uh, create a little bit bigger of a, a wound cavity when it hits uh, a person. The other thing is if it, if it hits a wall or something, it's not going to penetrate quite as much. So like in a home defense situation, you could hit a wall and it may not penetrate through and, and hit somebody else kind of situation. But that's the, the, the thought behind it. Okay. Well, there was talks about a pedal. You had mentioned something about a pedal. What, what is the pedal when, when we're talking about this particular jacketed hollow point? Uh, so if y'all can see the screen, um, it, it's kind of like flower petals that kind of come out. So it's, it, it mushrooms out. But each little uh, petal, it's designed to, to kind of break like that. There's little uh, lines that are, that are uh, scarved, uh, scratched in there. It's called skives. But they're designed to create petals and mushroom out. So these are, these are because you said they had lines, these are perforated bullets that have lines to allow it to, to petal out in, that, in this design. Yeah, that's a normal looking um, design when it when it um, expands. Now, now I did uh, bend the petals out straight because the petals can kind of cover the bearing surface, and so I bent them out straight. But typically, they, they kind of mushroom, like like look like a mushroom. If that makes any sense at all. So I do want to actually ask you about that. You said that the petals cover which area again? Uh, the bearing surface. Where, where it engages the rifle. So the bearing surface is what engages engages the rifle. Yeah. Which is essentially what engages it to spin, like you said, a quarterback throwing the football. That's correct. To go further and more <coughs> precise. Yes, more accurate. Yep. And you look for rifling when you conduct an examination on an unknown source, correct? Try to see what's the rifling on this compared to a known source. Yes, that's a class characteristic that we look at. So this bullet looks pretty beat up. And it may be difficult to see. Um, actually, in our field, this, this bullet is in really, really good shape. Um, the, the base is, is in, in round. It's not out of... It's, it's in excellent shape. So this area right here, past the pedals, where it, you know, is solid, like you said, in good shape, that is where you're looking for the rifling. I'm sorry about that. Uh, yes, typically uh, it's, again, this bullet kind of shows it. You kind of have the nose area that, that's kind of pointed down, it kind of tapers. This part is not going to engage the rifling. Uh, this part and beyond is going to engage. Now, I'm going to permission to approach you. Yeah. I'm going to show you what again been marked as and admitted as states exhibit 57. If I show you, and here, you can take a hold of that. If I show it to you like that, with the naked eye alone, as you're looking at it right now, in this courtroom. Can you tell me anything about the rifling? Uh, well, <clears throat> I don't like to do analysis on the stand, and as I get older, my eyes aren't 
getting as good, so I need glasses to. But um, I, I do have in my notes that it's a polygonal six right rifling. Okay. So is it safe to say then that this is something that's done on a microscopic level? Yeah, I mean, typically I put it under a stereoscope to, to look at the rifling and count the lands and grooves and look at the direction of twist. Okay. You also talked about um, an article that was put out or a study that was put out with regards to the 10 Ruger barrels that were manufactured one after the other and that science allows you to say exactly which barrel fired which particular bullet. Do you know why that is? Uh, I do. Could you please explain to the jury why that is the case? So the, the surface of tools and uh, firearms, they have random, unique, microscopic features on them. Again, kind of like fingerprints. And when the, the, the barrel is made out, of, it's almost always made out of steel, a real hard metal. And when it comes in contact with softer metals like brass or copper, which ammunition is, is made out of usually, um, the harder barrel is going to leave those random, unique, microscopic features on the softer metal. Pass the witness, Your Honor. Mr. Brown, your excuse? Thank you You're so much. You're released from the subpoena you made. You need to back to your business. Thank you. Yeah, maybe we probably Can we excuse him? Or? Yes, that's fine. Ladies and gentlemen, Drew, we're going to actually recess for lunch, and I'm, uh, you, you'll be on break until 1 p.m. It's 11.35, so you have a little longer lunch break than, than we've had. Um, and uh, again, I'll just remind you not to discuss the facts of the case, not to watch any news accounts or read any articles regarding this case. So you'll be on lunch break until 1 p.m. Thank you. All right, Mr. Drew.
You may be seated. Let me just find out from the lawyers where we're at. Mr. Alanis, Mr. Perez. You want to approach? Yes, sir. Yes. All right, let's bring the jury in, please. All right, let's bring the jury in.
Good afternoon. All right. The state, go ahead. Good afternoon, Your Honor. The state calls Dr. Jenny Lonsberry. She will be examined by uh, ADA Karina Rios. Good afternoon. Can you please raise your right hand? You sound for the testimony you're going to give during this trial will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I hope you got. Thank you. Thank you. May take the witness stand, please. for the state of Texas, for the record. Good afternoon. Oh, okay. Good afternoon, Dr. Lonsberry. Could you please state your full name for the record? My name is Jenny Lonsberry. And Dr. Lonsberry, how are you employed? I'm a forensic scientist at the Texas Department of Public Safety in Houston. And how long have you worked as a forensic scientist? About nine and a half years. And could you please walk us through your educational background? I have a bachelor's degree in chemistry from Utica College a Master's of Science in Forensic Science from the University of New Haven, and I hold a PhD in Chemistry from the University of Virginia. Do you have any additional training um, or background that qualifies you as an expert? Yes. And could you go through that? When I started at the department uh, nine and a half years ago, I was entered into the Trace Evidence Training Program. Uh, this involved um, reading the uh, current literature, um, practice exercises, um, independent competency exams, mock trials um, for all of the various disciplines that I am trained in. And is the lab that you work at accredited? Yes. Who is it accredited by? The Texas Department of Public Safety Crime Lab is accredited by the Texas Forensic Science Commission and the American National Standard Institute, American National Laboratory Accrediting Board. And have you been proficiency tested in this discipline? Yes. And um, when was, do you recall the last time? Uh, earlier this year. And so are you yourself licensed as a forensic analyst? Yes. By who? The Texas Forensic Science Commission. Have you testified in court as an expert before? Yes. How many times approximately? Approximately 20. Okay. So I'm, I heard you mention that you are a forensic scientist with DPS. Um, could, could you tell us what your duties are? I am specifically assigned to the trace evidence section. Uh, so I analyze evidence, uh, prepare reports, um, provide training for uh, newer analysts, um, provide court testimony when needed, um, and any other forensic um, uh, services that might be needed. And what is trace evidence? Trace evidence is uh, minute material left behind through some kind of a transfer, so this can include hairs, fibers, paint, and in this case, tire impressions. Okay. Um, and how do you conduct uh, tire impression comparisons? Uh, it starts with a visual exam of the questioned item. Uh, I determine if, in fact, it is a tire impression. If it is, what kind of design it might have. Um, and then I compare it to the known impression uh, using visual and side-by-side -side methods. Um, so you said visual and side-by-side -side me uh, measures. What, what does that include? Um, it includes looking at the photographs they might have sent, um, the casted material that they might have sent, pictures from the scene, um, and I compare them as best I can. And if there is a ruler in the question in photos, I can compare them based on size. Um, and the side-by-side -side analysis is physically side-by-side -side on my desk, and I compare the features back and forth to each other. So in essence, what you do is you take, um, or could you, could you explain in layman's terms what, what it is that you do when you um, compare these two samples? I'm comparing the tread design, the width of the what are called lugs, those are the individual elements that make up that tread design. If there are a certain number of ribs present, I will compare those. Uh, I will compare the size of the lugs, um, the shape of the lugs, um, to determine if they are the same as the uh, known impression. And are there any uh, levels that you use to categorize the level to which they match? Uh, we do have a scale called our Categories of Association, which provides a measure of how uh, strong that association or disassociation is. Could you walk us through that scale? 
Sure. Um, our categories of, of association are numbered one through five. Uh, so category one is what's called a source association. This is our strongest association um, and is typically used in cases such as a physical fit where pieces of a broken item have physically fit back together similar to a jigsaw puzzle. Um, category two uh, is our category, uh, I'm sorry, our association on class characteristics. So this is a category where I have um, similar class characteristics. So using the example of um, tires, they would have the same size, shape, and tread design. We have a category three, which is our inconclusive, meaning that there are some similarities and some differences between the two items, so I couldn't render a conclusion. Uh, there's what's called a category four, which is a non-association, but I couldn't exclude the source. This category is typically used for paint samples. So for example, if I'm given a paint chip and I compare it to the known, and it's not similar to that known, I can't exclude that vehicle as, dif as v different vehicle parts are painted at different times with potentially different types of paint. <coughs> and the fifth category is our category five, and this would be an exclusion. So for example, if that paint was blue and the known was green, then I could exclude it from having come from that source. And can you please explain to us uh, what the process is like when the lab receives evidence for testing? Uh, when an officer brings evidence to the laboratory, it is received by our evidence receiving team who provides it with a barcode and a unique uh, laboratory case number. That barcode is placed on the evidence and it begins what's called the chain of custody. This will track the evidence as it moves to the laboratory from vault to analyst, back to vault, and then whenever it's returned. So whenever it's returned, um, you, you send it back to the county that sent it? Uh, it depends on where the case uh, originated from. Uh, so if it's a case based out of a Houston county, the agency will usually just come pick it up. Um, in this case, I think we probably would have sent the evidence back to the Laredo laboratory, and then that agency would have picked it up there. If it's a DPS case, like a trooper dropped it off or a Texas Ranger, we would hold on to it indefinitely. Okay. And uh, so you did receive evidence for this particular case? Yes. And did you pre prepare a report as part of your analysis? Yes. Your Honor, may I approach? Yes. I'm now going to show you what's been marked as State's Exhibit 237. And I'm going to ask if you recognize this document. Yes, I do. And did you prepare this yourself? Yes, I did. And was it done at or near the time when you conducted your analysis? Yes, it was. Your Honor, I'm going to send it over to the Defense Council and admit State Exemption 37 into evidence. Good. I'm going to object. It's not a business record or a government record. As to this witness, it's her personal report and therefore not admissible. She can, of course, use it to refresh her memory, but not as an exhibit at trial. Right. Well, the objections are ruled. Uh, it says Exhibit 237 is admitted to evidence at this time. Now, I'm going to show you some evidence. Um, and just to be clear, do I need to be using gloves when I'm handling some of these exhibits? The, the t that I'm going to show you? Um, the tire impressions, I don't believe so, unless there was some question of DNA analysis on the knowns or something like that. I'm going to show you State's Exhibit 63A. Do you recognize this item? Yes, I do. How do you recognize it? On this top flap here, you can see my handwritten case number, date, initials, and item number. Okay. Now, can I ask you to look inside of the box? And I'm going to ask if you should take out the, the item.
And can you tell us what was uh, State's Exhibit 63 is? State's Exhibit 63 is this brown paper wrapped uh, item which will contain the cast that was collected at the crime scene. Okay. And would, we, would it be possible to take the item out or? Yes. Okay. Could we go ahead and do that please? What uh, does this correspond to on your report? Uh, this will be um, listed on my report as item 2901, casted impression, parentheses, two pieces. Okay. Now I'm also going to show you some other exhibits. First I'm going to show you State's Exhibit 62. Do you recognize this item? Yes, I do. How do you recognize it? Once again, you can see my handwritten case number, item number, date, and initials. And to what number does this correspond on your um, report? Uh, that known tire impression is item 3501, known tire impression from suspect vehicle, parentheses, rear passenger side. been marked as State's Exhibit 61. Do you recognize this item? Yes, I do. How do you recognize it? Once again, you can see over on that side my uh, uh, handwritten case number, initials, date, and item number. And what does this date and time correspond to? The one above mine? Yes. I'm not sure. I would assume that's when it was collected. States Exhibit 59, same question. Do you recognize it? Yes, I do. And how do you recognize it? Again, we have my handwritten um, case number, date, initials, and item number. And what item does this correspond to on your report? That is item number 3504, known tire impression from suspect vehicle, parentheses, front right. States Exhibit 60. Yes, I do. How do you recognize it? Uh, again, on that side, we have my handwritten case number, uh, item number, date, and initials. And what item does this correspond to on your report? This is item number 3503 on my report, uh, known tire impression from suspect vehicle, parentheses, rear driver side. Okay, and when you compared these four uh, known samples, were there any differences between them? Uh, between the four known tires themselves? Yes. Uh, no, they were all the same uh, make and model and therefore tread design tire. Okay. Your Honor, permission to So, for purposes of uh, questioning, I will be referring to just one, but it, it's your testimony that they would all be the same? Correct. Okay. And now I'm going to post your Honor permission to publish State's Exhibit 63 on the ELMO. Mm -hmm. Okay. <coughs> Now, can you walk us through um, what you do and how you analyze these samples? Uh, so when I opened up this um, 
cast. Uh, it was covered in a lot of dirt and mud from when it was collected. Uh, so I used a soft brush to kind of remove some of that debris so that I could more uh, clearly see uh, the impression that had been collected. Uh, once I did that, I documented the features of the impression. So in this case, the lug shape and size and how many ribs I could see. Um, once I did that, I then opened up the knowns and did the same thing, documented the shape and size of the lugs, how many ribs I could see, um, and other features uh, like that before moving on to the comparison. Now I'm going to refer to your report and your notes in there. Do these dim dimensions correspond, or are these taken while you conduct your examination of these um, samples? Yes, they are. So could you explain, um, and could I actually ask you to step off the uh, witness stand, Your Honor, if you may, and, and kind of walk us through the measurements that you take? Um, can you all hear me okay? Um, so in this case, um, because I didn't have any images that I could resize, I had to work on side-by-side -side analysis alone. And normally when we do our comparison, I would make what's called an overlay, where I would copy the known onto transparency paper and then physically lay it over top of the photograph. That doesn't work in this particular case because the cast is lumpy and bumpy, and so I wouldn't be able to have a nice flat comparison. So in this case, I resorted to some measurements. Um, and so in this case, I was measuring, let's see, like for example, the width of these lugs here, the distance between these lugs here, I measured the lug here, um, and this is just to give me a baseline on approximation, approximations on how big these lugs might be uh, when I compare it to the um, question. Okay. And if I could now direct you over to, to I'm sorry, the cast. Are these the same measurements that you take here? Yes, so once again, you can see I measured the lugs down here. I measured the distance between the lugs here, and I measured the lug that was there. Thank you. And you can take this <coughs> again. Thank you so much. <coughs> and so just for reference, um, is this uh, cast impression that is up on display right now the same thing that was in your picture? Yes. Do you receive any other information regarding um, the samples that you receive? Just what would be listed on the submission form. So do you uh, know by any chance what scene this was associated with? May I refer to my notes? Mm -hmm. Um, according to the submission form I was provided, uh, the tire cast was taken from a scene and the victim listed on this particular submission form was Claudine Luera. Now, uh, when you made your comparisons, were you able to reach an opinion or a conclusion? Yes, I was. And what was it? Uh, in this case, uh, the question impression that was in the tire cast uh, was similar to the all four of the known tires in size, shape, and tread design, um, or any other tire with similar characteristics. And did you assign it to a particular category? Yes, I did. You're on a permission to publish? Mm -hmm. And what category was that? This fell into what's called a Category 2B. And could I have you explain what Category 2B is once more? Yes. Uh, when I explained Category 2 earlier uh, as a class association, that category can actually further be broken down into uh, 2A, 2B, and 2C. So a 2A association would be a class association with some sort of distinct feature. So for example, a paint chip that's been repainted. Um, class B, or I'm sorry, category 2B is where most of our analyses will fall. It could have come from that object or any other object with similar features. And then we have what's called a 2C. So this is a class association based on limited characteristics. So something about the question impression is limited. Maybe it's blurry or maybe there's a paint layer missing or some other analysis, some other feature of that item makes the analysis limited. Thank you. And therefore, is it your opinion that any four of these tires that you re received could have been the one that left that tire impression 
On the scene? At the scene? Yes, or any other tire with similar tread characteristics. Ms. Lansbury, uh, good afternoon. Hello. My name is Raymond Fuchs, and along with Owen Patters, we represent Juan de Ortiz. Uh, you, you'd mentioned that there's different categories that, that you come up with in, when you're doing these uh, co comparisons. Correct. And, and which one did you say was applicable in this case? In this case, it was a Category 2B. Okay, so, so that's... Uh, Association with conventional characteristics. Correct. Okay. And, and I believe what you're saying is those uh, impressions that you analyzed, including the cast and the, the paper, if you will, were what you're saying is they came from this kind of tire. Yes, the, whatever the brand information was listed on the known tire impression. Okay. Uh, you're not saying it's this tire or any tire that was on that Dodge truck. Correct. Um, as far as I know, these tires were on a suspect vehicle, um, so all four of the tires have the same uh, tread design, and my conclusion is that the question impression could have come from any of those four tires or any other tire with similar characteristics. Okay. And now, as far as the, the, the plaster cast uh, that you were talking about, do, do you have any way to determine when the, the tire impression was made from which that cast was made? I do not. Okay. So it could have been there a month, as far as you know. Could have been. Yeah. Okay. Now you also mentioned in your report on the first page, and if you need to refer to it, that's fine, that dirt and debris was collected from this item but not examined. Correct. Okay. Are there occasions where the Texas Department of Public Safety Laboratory does such a comparison, a comparative analysis? We no longer do soil analysis. Okay. So if, if for example, you had been submitted a, a I guess you'd call it here dirt and debris, dirt and debris from where that uh, cast was uh, collected. You wouldn't have had any way to anal analyze that dirt and debris? No, I would not. Okay. Does the DPS have that at all? Not anymore, no. Okay. You know if the FBI has it? I am unaware if the DP uh, I'm sorry, if the FBI has soil analysis. I, I don't know. Okay, but it was done at one time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's still done today. I just not. I don't know who does it. Okay. I pass the witness. Here. Dr. Monser, you previously testified that you received information that these came from uh, Claudine Luera's crime scene. Were you aware that this was a uh, homicide or murder investigation? Yes. Okay. No further questions, Your Honor. Excuse me, Mr. Bell. Thank you. You're released from the subpoena if you need to go back to work. Okay. You're released from the subpoena. Thank yeah. you, Your Honor. The state's going to call Dana Sarquiz. Number 12? No, I'm sorry, number 11. Okay. Good afternoon. Can you raise your right, right hand second for me? Do you follow me for the testimony you're going to give during this trial? Will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So I'll be glad. Yes. Thank you. May take the witness stand.
set up. Excuse me. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes, thank you. Okay, great. All right, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Could you please state your name for the record? Dana Paula Sarkis. Okay. And uh, Ms. Sarkis, uh, how are you employed? I am currently employed at the Webb County Sheriff's Office. Okay, now I'm going to ask you if you could please uh, uh, get near the, the mic and speak up loudly, please. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, you are employed by the Webb County Jail? Yes, sir. Okay. And how? Uh, what is your position with the Webb County Jail? I am the supervisor at the Intelligence Division. Okay. And uh, uh, briefly, how long have you been with the Webb County Jail? Approximately four years. Okay. What are your duties and responsibilities in the Intelligence Division of the Webb County Sheriff's Department? Is that appropriate? Yes. Okay. Please tell the ladies and gentlemen of the jury what your duties and responsibilities are. Our duties are to monitor inmate phone calls, to deter any illegal activity from happening inside and out of the jail, as well as to monitor the inmate phone calls for their safety and the safety of the jail. Okay. So, um, let's, let's start from the beginning. When an inmate arrives at Webb County Jail, um, how are they? Uh, how are they monitored? Uh, or, or let me back up. Mm -hmm. They're allowed to, to make phone calls, correct? Right. Yes. And the county jail provides a f a phones so that they can call whoever they want to call. Correct? Yes. And uh, what is what are the protocols? What are the procedures that you all at the Webb County Jail have uh, for an inmate who wants to use the phones? So there are certain instructions you get. You first, when you're first booked, you get an ID or SO number, and then you have instructions you need to follow in order for you to make your first phone call. After you follow the instructions, the instructions are you need to create your own PIN, your personal identification number that you create yourself. You need to state your name, and then you need to state the United States of America. After you have completed those steps, they're both in Spanish and English, and you have your access to, your, to the phones. <laughs> Uh, and in uh, in your analyst capacity or supervisor of this uh, this division, uh, uh, specifically, how many uh, analysts do you have listening in on phone calls? Approximately seven. Okay. Do you have a system, uh, database, or program uh, that is utilized, or are you taking hand notes, or how does this work? Explain to the jury. It's a system. It's called IC Solutions, and it's a phone system where you can see every single inmate phone calls. So it's recorded and monitored. The way I would go into listening to the actual phone calls, you would go into the call records. You would get a list of all the inmates that have made a call, either live, completed or attempted call. Once you choose the phone you wanna the phone call you want to listen to, you will get the date, the time, the CSN, the call sequence number, along with the ID of the inmate the last name of the inmate, the phone number the inmate called, and the station where the inmate is stationed at. So the station meaning the cell. So either the booking or medical, wherever the phone call came out of. Does the inmate pay for these types of services? The first time, I believe it's for free. After that, yes, you need to be inserting your calling cards. So it's like purchasing a calling card, mm -hmm. you, buy, you buy minutes? Yes. Basically. And any inmate that wants to be calling uh, friends, family, or lawyers can, can buy minutes? Yes. Okay. Um, is the person, specifically the inmate, who is dialing his code and his PIN number, is he made aware that, that, his, that his phone call is being monitored? Yes, there's the pre-recorded message letting the inmate know that the phone call is being recorded and could be potentially monitored at any time. Okay, and it, and, and so they're fully aware that uh, the statements they make can be used in a law enforcement 
uh, operation or for court proceedings like this one? Yes. Okay. Now, I want to ask you, on, in, 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 in 2018, were okay. you employed in your capacity as an analyst? No, I was not. I didn't get there to 2019. Okay, and in, in 2019, you assumed the responsibilities of of this division? Yes, I did. Was this system already in place at that time? Yes, sir. Okay. Did you receive training uh, to learn how to oversee the system? Yes, I did. Okay. Are you aware with the Are you aware uh, with the name Juan David Ortiz? Yes, sir. And who is that? He's sitting right over there with his two attorneys. Okay, and uh, what can you describe an article of clothing he's wearing? He's wearing a black and color suit with a blue and color tie. Okay. Now, currently, is is he uh, uh, an inmate there at Webb County Jail? He was released, I believe, October of twenty, October seventeenth of twenty twenty two. Okay. When you say release, that means that he was moved from Webb County custody to, to Bear County. Yes, sir. Because we are here in Bear County. Exactly. Okay. So he left your custody. Exactly. Okay. Uh, approximately how long was he in Webb County's custody? Approximately four years. Okay. And during those four years, uh, did he have a uh, did he have a calling card? Yes, he did. Did he have a pin? Yes, he did. Did he have a code? Yes, he did. Okay. And did he make phone calls? Yes, he did. Uh, from the Webb County Jail. Yes. Did he call family? Yes. Uh, did he call his attorneys? Yes. Um, and other people? Yes. Or relatives? Had you had the occasion using this system? What's the system called again? IC Solutions. IC Solutions. Uh, I, uh, is it a database system, computerized system? Yes. Okay. Have you had an opportunity to listen uh, to phone calls by Juan de Vero? Yes. Okay. And in preparation for this uh, case, uh, were you able to uh, examine? Uh, listen to phone calls that were made from Webb County during his time that he was in custody with Webb County. Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. I'm going to show you State's Exhibit 238 and uh, ask you if you're familiar with this. CD. Yes, I'm familiar. And how are you familiar with it? This is the CD that I provided the district attorney's office. Okay. And are you familiar with the contents of within that CD? Yes, I am. And what what are the contents? It's a phone call made by Juan David Ortiz. Okay, that's all I want to know. So it, it this 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 recording uh, is as you say, phone calls made by Juan David Ortiz from the Webb County Jail. Yes. Preserved on. Your system. Yes. Okay. And you've listened to them. Yes. Okay. And and you prepared this. Yes. Okay. And I'm going to show you State's Exhibit 239. What 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 am I handing you? Same thing. The CD that I provided the district attorney's office. And what what is what is contained within this CD? A phone call made by Juan David Ortiz. And are these phone calls on both 238 and 239? Have they been altered or, or materially changed in any way? No. Are they in their original state as the time that when they were recorded and captured during the phone call? Yes. Okay. Thank you. And at this time, I'm going to tender states to the 238 and 239 to the defense. Move to. Uh, Can we have points to use? Yes, we want to
Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I need to take up a, a legal matter outside of your presence. And uh, from what I'm hearing, it may take a little while, maybe up to an hour. So just to warn you, uh, I will uh, again advise you not to discuss the facts of the case or um, watch any news accounts or re read any articles regarding this case. Uh, can we please the jury, please? All right, to the jury. You may be seated. There was an objection to predicate, so I don't know if you want to get into the predicate questions before the board dialogue, because you did object to the proper predica predicate. I object to the proper predicate, John. This year, yeah. recently is what I heard him say at the bench. I believe I did establish the proper predicate, but I will once again uh, uh, ask her the uh, the predicate questions. Uh, I showed you 238 and 239. Uh, are you familiar with these CDs? Yes. Uh, let's talk about 238. Uh, are you the custodian of, of this CD? Yes. Um, and what does this CD contain? That contains a phone call of Juan David Ortiz. Do you remember the date that this phone that call was is made? is approximately November 6th, November 7th of 2018. Okay. And uh, this is kept in your system? Yes. What is your system? I see solutions. Okay, now this particular state exhibit 238, have you listened to it? Yes, I did. In its entirety? Yes. Has it been materially altered, changed, or modified in any way? No. And it's, it's exactly how it was recorded on November the 6th or 7th of 2018? Yes, sir. And been preserved in your, in your system since then? Yes and you tendered this to the district attorney's office? Yes, sir. Please tell the court, if when we play this, mm -hmm. okay, what is it that the court is going to hear? The court is going to hear Juan David Ortiz being concerned about a statement he made, and he wants to ask his lawyer to please suppress it. Okay. Besides that, is there anything... Uh, he does a regular family call and he talks with his mom and tells her about the that he's concerned about a statement he made and that he asked his attorney if he could please suppress that, that sentence or the statement he made. So in essence, he regrets making the statement. Right. Which was his confession. Yes. Okay. And this is approximately a month after he was arrested, right? Right. More or less. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, and just for clarification for my purposes, when you say he's, he's telling someone else that he's going to ask his attorney to suppress it or is it a conversation with his attorney? No, it's a conversation with his mom or his family members, and he tells his mom that he's concerned about the statement he made, and he w he asked his lawyers if he could please suppress that but he's statement. he's telling Mr. Okay. Yes, sir. So, uh, just for clarification, for the record, he's not talking to his lawyer. No. If he was talking to his lawyer, would you be recording it? No, we cannot listen to attorney privilege calls. Okay, very good. All right. So that's two thirty-eight. Yes, sir. Okay. Now let's move into two thirty-nine. Same questions. Tell me about this uh, DVD. Are you familiar with it? Yes, I am. And was it created by yourself? Yes. And it was uh, through your system? Yes, I see solutions. It? I see solutions. Mm -hmm. And it contains a recording? Yes, sir. When was this recording made? That one was made approximately July 10th of 2018. 2020, excuse 20, me. 2018 or 2020? 2020. Okay and has his conversation during that time who was he speaking with on this recording he was speaking to his kids and then he speaks to his wife okay. and when he speaks to his wife what is he telling his wife well he's they're talking about court proceedings and he goes on by talking about a book and then towards the very end he challenges whoever's listening to the phone call by saying that he's not suicidal okay if you recall to your best of your recollection, and you've listened to this, right? Yes, sir. When was the last time you heard this? Last night. Okay. How does he How does he challenge the listener? <coughs> the, the listener means somebody like you, right? Right, the analyst. To so the analyst. And what is he telling the analyst? 
that if you hear the whole conversation, he is not suicidal, I am not suicidal. He says, if you're listening to me, I am not suicidal. Yes, sir. I repeat, I am not suicidal. Yes, sir. Uh, does he say anything else that's like relevant for law enforcement purposes? Just the fact that he was reading a book. Okay, and and how? What's the significance of that book in, in his mind? He is comparing his case to the case of Casey Anthony that occurred in Florida. Okay, and that's it. Yes, sir. And does this CD has it been modified, changed, altered in any way? No. Does it contain that recording in its entirety? Yes. And how long is this recording? Approximately 30 minutes. Okay, and, and 239, how long is 239? Approximately 30 minutes. In any of these recordings, does he discuss other crimes, offenses, drug use, anything incriminating? No. Nothing at all? No. no, no again, we, we move to introduce uh, uh, Mr. Pettis, you want to take, take yes. on board there? You may. Uh, Please. Yes. Hi, I'm Joel Perez. Um, with regards to the, the, it'll be the in 238. Now, when you testify it, right now that Mr. Ortiz is speaking to his mother, mm -hmm. um, you don't know that from your own personal knowledge, do you? Do you? Do you know? You don't know her mother personally, do you? No. Okay, so let's say his aunt had called. Okay. Okay, and and she's pretending to be her mother. Right now, you'd be testifying the call was with his mother. Well, I'm just gonna object just to the mischaracterization. His aunt can't call in, right? People can't call in. No. Well, he, he has to call. I understand that. Okay, that's fine. He he makes a call. Okay. But if the person on the other end uh, was his aunt, but she pretends to be the mother, right now you'd be testifying he was speaking to his mother, right? No, because you can tell who the inmate is speaking to. No, do you know his mother? Do you know her voice? After listening to someone for four years, yes. No, but do you personally know her voice is what I'm saying. If a woman came in right now and started speaking, would you be able to, are you a voice recognition expert? No, I'm okay. not an expert. So you don't know her mother personally, so you don't know the voice of her mother, of his mother, right? Right. Okay, and the same thing applies over here. You don't know his wife personally. No. You lack personal knowledge of how, how, what his wife's voice sounds like. You're only testifying that he was talking to his wife because that's what's said on the recording. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? Right, and the okay. context of the call as well. Okay. But uh, either way, so that's our objection, Your Honor, that she lacks personal knowledge of the, the, the individuals on the recording. Uh, and therefore it's not admissible. Before it's admissible, she needs to be able to identify the voices herein from her own personal knowledge and not from what she heard in the content. Um, if I can just ask her a Go couple ahead. more questions. Do you recognize Juan David Ortiz's voice on the recording? Yes. Does he identify the persons that he's talking to while on the recording? Yes, either by saying mom or babe or chipmunk, whatever. Yeah. Yes. Are, are you familiar with his wife's name? Yes. The, and what is her name? Daniela Ortiz. Okay. And you and and the, like you just started to explain, you've been listening to the, the he, he lived there in your jail for almost four years. Yes, sir. You've become familiar with all his family, correct? Yes, sir. You recognize through his identification, through his through his own voice. Yes, sir. Who he's speaking to, correct? Yes. <coughs> okay. That's all I know. Anything else, Mr. Pettis? I'm sorry, Your Honor. Anything else he's uh, well, we're still objecting to the predicate because it's only it's hearsay to this young lady. It's, so she lacks personal knowledge regardless of what is said. It's still hearsay to her. Uh, so that's our objection to the predicate. And then we would object to uh, relevance on those two issues, but we'd ask the court to listen to the calls outside the presence. And then, uh, because even though they're offering them for these two specific areas, uh, there's other items that are discussed in there, and so we still want to, on relevance grounds for the court to listen to determine the admissibility in particular because we do have motions uh, on on oral statements of the defendant, Your Honor. Well, well, that was addressed at the bench conference, and there was a hearing where I believe we the, the hearing was cut short because the defense withdrew a motion. Was that not the motion that was withdrawn? 
No, the motion that we withdrew, and, and let me refresh my memory. We were talking about. Uh, it was supposed to be jail calls. I remember, and if that was an issue that was brought up, or oh, is that not the motion? Go ahead, Mr. Alani. And that he requested to reopen the Jackson Dano. Yes. He requested to reopen the motion to suppress his confession because of some new evidence that they were going to produce that Mr. Ortiz, during the time of his arrest at the Ava Hotel, had between there and the jail had requested an attorney. When we indicated and met and, and revealed that we had everything recorded, including the November 7th phone call that we were going to play where he's talking to his mother saying, I regret my statements, they withdrew their request to reopen that hearing. This is, not a, this is not a surprise. Well, it, no, it had nothing to do with the jail calls. It, he wasn't, uh, well, without disclosing attorney-client privilege, our contention was that at the time during transport, uh, that Mr. Ortiz had uh, uh, requested a lawyer. If you recall, Mr. Alanis's contention at the time was that he had a recording all the way through, and so therefore we withdrew our motion on that issue only. Nothing to do with jail calls. But there was a discussion about additional witnesses at that hearing that were not, not going to be needed because of the fact that the defense was withdrawing that motion. It's what I'm, it's what I'm recalling. So in, in any event, so you want me to hear or listen to these? Yes, Your Honor. Each, each one is 30 minutes long. Um, when I'm editing, it, it, you know, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, we're, we're entitled to uh, a relevance of you, And for the record, this is the address at the bench conference. The defense has, seen, has, has received these D CV, or CDs, obviously you listen to them based on what you're arguing, right? Yes, Your Honor. However, when, a, when the defense files a motion and says, look, let's say a defendant made 20 statements along the line, and we file a motion and say, you know, let's have a pretrial hearing and tell us what oral statements you intend to offer. And they say these five, but not, you know, not six through 20. Uh -huh. We're entitled to rely on that representation. We filed a motion saying, produce. But, but right now you want the court to listen to the, to the CDs. Is there a specific language based on what you've listened to that you are asking the court to limit the hour, to, to redact, or what, what is it that? Well, yes, if, if the relevance is these two particular uh, tidbits, yeah, to redact them. All this other chatter, I mean, it wouldn't be relevant. Are you able to do that? Sorry. If that's all you're asking to, Your to Honor, present? The memo we have is that the, the defense made his, his mental status, his mental state, uh, an issue. Listening, in, listening to his conversations, his orientation as to time, as to place, as to issues that are going on, real time, uh, global issues, issues at home, the it, this, it, issues of evolving his case, strategy that he has, opinions that so he you're has. Saying it's relevant based on all that. It's all relevant. relevant. It's all relevant, uh, uh, and it's in, it's certainly it, it's enlightening. Uh, it's relevant. It's helpful for the jury at one of their issues. Well, I mean, I mean, the defense wants me to listen to. It, then I guess I'll, I'll listen to it and then make make a call. Yes. All the contentions that we've made regarding his mental state. We've not discussed anything past September the 15th of 28. Everything we've discussed regarding the defendant's mental state is pre-September 15th, 2018. I haven't heard any one of us say anything, oh, and then in December of 2018, he was all wacko or whatever. So therefore, them offering it to show that he has a mental There's state. There's nothing to rebut you're saying at this point. Yeah, we didn't, we didn't bring it up. Well, I would disagree with that because it, during the during he made it an issue with Calderon and with the Ranger about the the, the crisis affecting the, the memory that it was a blackout uh, that he couldn't remember committing these uh, offenses, and uh, it, it, it it goes it goes to that it, go, it goes back to the, the 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 time in question listening to to the best evidence as counsel likes to say these CDs are the best evidence. Well, again, Your Honor, I would say to the court that. All the, everything we've contended is 918, I mean, I'm sorry, September 15th of 2018 and pre. No one said anything on our side post, and these are post. And so therefore, they're not relevant, and they're trying to rebut something that we didn't bring up. Your Honor, we, would, we, would, we, we agree with counsel on this aspect, that the court listen to both recordings and decide what's, what's relevant. Uh, so for we're asking you, Your Honor. Oh. Oh. 
Do you want me to listen to them here in open court, or do you want me to listen to them on my own? And uh, okay. We would be okay with you listening in chambers, Your Honor. Okay. We would be okay with you listening from here. Yeah. Well, if, the, if there's no objection from the defense, I'll listen to it in chambers. The defense has already listened to them, obviously. Not be specific, Your Honor. Well, there's, there's a lot of recording. We understand the testimony, but we have not been given the opportunity to listen to those particular exhibits. They had them in this uh, Excuse me, Judge. We're talking about the ones that are being offered right now, not other copies. We You want to make sure it's the same those. thing you've, you've, you've previously listened to. That's what you're saying. You don't know if it's what was you previously were provided. Well, you know, it's not that I don't trust the witness. But, that, but that's what you're saying. But right? I don't know what's on those CDs. Yes. All right. Well, then, do you want to play them? Yes. We can pay them. Yes, go ahead. Play. Uh, Are you playing here, Your Honor? 238. Play. 239. <coughs> <coughs> First. This is the November. This is the. Let me do this also for our court, the benefit of my my court reporter. So, they'll be introduced either as court exhibits or trial exhibits. So they're going to be part of the record, so that there has doesn't have to be a, a transcription of it as it's playing. So it'll be it'll be available there uh, if it, if it if it becomes necessary. Yes. Them for this hearing, I'm saying they'll be admitted. They'll be they'll be at a minimum. They're going to be uh, court exhibits that will okay. be just in the record. Right. Okay. No, no objection. So, so that so, be, so I, she doesn't have to be because she, she may have to pause if she didn't hear something. Oh yeah. Uh, That's fine. It, but it'll be available there for the record. Thank you. And I'll make a decision on your objections on the predicate as to whether or not they become trial exhibits. Right. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Yeah. This is November six, twenty eighteen. States Exhibit 239. So you're playing 239 first? You're playing 239 first? Correct, sir. Okay.
Please enter the area code, prefix, and number to make an international... Your account balance is $10. The cost of this call will be $0.25 cents for the first minute and $0.25 cents for each additional minute, excluding taxes and other applicable fees. The time limit is 30 minutes.
over and over in the Bible how he says, and even in the Bible says, that he has power over all the nations. I mean, literally, he takes control over everything. Yeah, Mama. Yes, yes. We have more to read? Hope. Oh, yeah. My, and I, when I pray to God and I tell him, you are my hope. Like, we are our hope. We are our strength. We are our hope. Like, that's all we have. And, 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 and at the end of the day, this is how I, I feel and this is what I tell God. Like, our purpose in life, first and foremost, is to worship Him and to praise Him. Then the other stuff come into play, and 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 my goal is is at the very end, like the light at the end of my tunnel is when I am with him for eternity. So um, so yo sé lo que él puede hacer, lo que es imposible para uno, él lo puede hacer. I mean, he literally controls the whole world. Oh, I just want to make sure that we're all. Because he knows 
all the challenges and conflicts that as a human we face. So, um, so see, no more, it's not mad. It's, it's more of a doubt, yes, because I think that's just natural. I've even doubted uh, myself. But I think we do need to refocus on, on God and what he, he can do. It's just where, como te digo, es que es lo más que, que, que todo sea en su tiempo y en la voluntad de él. Este, y ya, y I hope for the best. And, and that's it. That's it. But también tú, también tú. You know, baby, I mean, just seeing things on TV. I mean, prostitution is going to you know, be ugly and paint to this horrible...
Nám Understanding that I that I had the actual conversation regarding uh, that we just heard on 239 on 239 this conversation is between who the wife and Juan David Ortiz okay. Daniela Ortiz and Juan David Ortiz okay. it's not the mother no okay so I was mistaken when I said this phone call was between Daniela Ortiz his wife and Juan David Ortiz and you can also verify the phone number are you familiar with the phone number that he's calling? Yes, it's a 956-516, something like that. Okay, and who does that number belong to? That belongs to Daniel Ortiz. Okay. Pass the witness. If I may, uh, Ms. Sarquist, what was the date of this call? That call was made September 10, 2018. September 10th, is that right? We're talking about 239. Oh, excuse me, it was November... 
six, two thousand and eighteen. The phone number that was on that was five four five three four eight six. Five four five. That's what that, that's what it said at the beginning of the CD. I'm not sure. I'll have to hear it again. It said November six, two thousand eighteen, <laughs> seven thirty-four p.m. And I, I heard <laughs> the one nine five six five four five three four eight six is the number I I, I, I wrote down. I, I would just for clarification. Do you have your notes? Uh, I don't have my notes. Okay. Do you have access to the phone number he was calling? Yes. And where are those? In my notes. Okay. And where are your notes? In the witness room. Okay. But that number that the judge just that comes out in the beginning. Yes. Judge, what number was that again? What I wrote down was five four five. Well, it was one nine five six five four five three four eight six. Is what I heard. And I heard the date that you just mentioned, 11-6-2018, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. it also said 7.34 p.m., and then they had that phone number. Is that number her... And, and I wrote it down because I thought that might be an issue as to well, whose I, number I wanna, I wa w Would your notes help you yes. verify that that's, in fact, Daniela Ortiz's yes. number? Yes. I know that? that the mother's phone number starts with a 210, and Daniela's is a 956. Sorry, in the witness room. Yes. Okay. But uh, I don't know if you want to ask her some questions. Is it a notebook? Yes, it's pink. Captain Calderon should have it. Yes, it is a nine five six five four five three four eighty six. And whose phone number is that? That is Daniela Ortiz's phone number. The wife. Yes. And that was her voice. Yes. Not the mother. No. Okay. Um, may I just review the thoughts that you have? Okay, and, and just very briefly. Yes. Just and on, on exhibit two, 239, where is the number that you're referring okay. to? You can show it to me. Yes, of course. Uh, so this one would be the first one. Okay. Right here, that's the phone number. And then this would be the second phone number. The okay. the same phone number. And then, uh, but from your notes, these these papers are these something that you generated, or the system automatically kicked out? The down? system automatically generated. Okay. Yes. And just to confirm, what is the number that was called on State Exhibit Two Thirty Nine? Can you just read it out? Yes. Nine five six five four five thirty four eighty six. Okay. And when you say that that number belongs to Diana Ortiz, just uh, generally speaking, how do you know that? So on our system, we have the reverse phone lookup. 
and if she's registered, I'm not really sure how that works, but sometimes the actual register of the phone comes up, and hers came up to Daniela Ortiz. In this one, you specifically have personal knowledge that that name came up with that number? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, we know some of that. Okay. I, I, I have no further questions of this young lady. On that issue, you're going to pay the other. So, you also have 238, or is this the only one you're offering? No, I also have 238. I'd like to do the same thing, Your Honor. Okay. With the court's permission. Um, yeah, yeah, well, let's go ahead and listen to 238 and then we'll. Yeah, uh, before we take 238, was where was the phone call made to, on, 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 on uh, September of 2020? The one we're going to yes. listen to now. Where was that phone call made? When it was made, September. No, July. July. Yes, 10th of 2020. Okay, my correction. July 10th, 2020. From who to who? It was from Juan David Ortiz to, again, his wife, Daniela Ortiz, using the same phone number. Same phone number. Yes, sir. Registered in your system. Yes. The 956-545-3486. Okay. And and this is, the, this is also the... You listen to this, correct? Yes. And he's discussing the legal proceedings? Yes. Comparing his case... To a case of uh, Casey Anthony, okay. and then just speaks about how he's not so entitled and challenges the listeners. Okay. Can you repeat that last thing you said? Yes, he challenges the listeners that he's not suicidal. Yes. Okay. Six, three. Yes.
curiosamente, she lied, or lied, about what she had originally said. According to you, she lied about that, so, unless she didn't, then you lied to me. About the very initial thing that she had written to your attorney. understand in a way my position which I don't I don't think you do. I don't think you do and and which is fine. Hey, so which is on I think I I I'm doing the right thing and um 
I really don't care what people say to be honest. Um, pero eso es también, I don't know, if you even put yourself in those shoes for a second. Because sometimes I... Huh? Right. And so, yeah, but it makes me sometimes wonder if, like, wow, would they just do such things and the people do it around or switch? But I guess. Thank you. 
something. It was to the point yeah. where, where I even said, I'm not moving. You know? <laughs> if I get down your bed, you can see my hands. They're right there. Oh, oh. Yeah. So, so, I don't get down. Stop resisting. I'm not resisting. I'm not doing anything. But, so, they, they would talk to someone. They wanted to talk to him. They were. Yeah. So. Well, I mean, he makes you wonder than the video. Oh, I'm sure. I, I won't worry. In the year 2020, it's happened 2018. I'm sure of this. So, it's a close outline. And, uh, it's there. Back to it with the whole, oh, he's playing his cell phone. Like, get the fuck out of here, dude. Seriously, no, get the fuck out of here. No. Uh, one of the, the news articles, Oh, when he came out of the gas station, they saw that he was not armed until the cases came out. Lying pieces of fucking shit. And um, I know they're listening. If they want to play this phone call, they play it, dude. They're lying. They're fucking lying. They came at me with a rifle and a pistol. So that's not a taser. So, I'm um, not a blessing gun. But anyway, that's what I was referring to. I want to come out and do one like on this. Like, man, you've been like this for the last few days, so I don't know. 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 I or like confidential or whatever. Yeah, it's just there's so many similarities with the way the, 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 the she was also arrested by the sheriff's department. Uh, the sheriff's yeah. department was releasing a lot of stuff to the media. The district attorney loved all the attention they were getting. And like, it, like everything is fucking just weird. Like how it all got handled. And uh, they fucking down fuck investigator got it on and my pink way you know, the local band that hooked it on me doing interviews with interrogation. I'm like, dude, get the fuck out of here, dude. All all and coincidentally in that book, he was also an election year. Which be dumb. Uh, you know, not reelected too. I'm I'm cutting all that a lot of like striking similarities, and I'm like, what the fuck, dude? So. Like, this, if it's backed up by law, there's no way you can, like, 
State's Exhibit 238 yes. that took place on, on um, July 10th of 2020. July 10th of 2020. Okay. And you verified the phone number was to his wife, Daniela. Yes. And, and you can identify both voices. Yes. Thank you. That's all. Right. And, uh, Ms. Ms. Sorry, Ms. Tell me again, the, the, I, mean, I made a lot of notes here. I was listening to it. I know a lot of the conversation was in 239 was with the children. Uh, 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 I would say of 30 minutes, most of the most of the talking, or, or, or I guess the person speaking the most was the wife and kids. Um, I did see, I guess, the area that you may have mentioned about that he was concerned about the statement uh, that he wanted his attorney to suppress that he. There was no evidence that he gave a lot of detail in that statement. That comes maybe the, the last 15 minutes of the of the first exhibit, but everything before that, I, I don't see any relevance. Well, the, the main relevance that we want to uh, focus on and, uh, is, of course, the statement surrounding the uh, confession. Uh, and, and so right before that, he says, uh, if we're all on the same page, and then he goes into that he's concerned about this the confession and that he's going to try and see if they can get it suppressed. Right. Everything before that, again, I listened to it very carefully and it was really the family, the children speaking. Um, I, I really don't see any relevance in that and part. So if you want to 
if you want to redact all that, uh, I, I'll consider uh, allowing the portion where he says uh, we're on the same page. We will agree to do that, Your Honor. Yes, sir. The last, whatever the number been, I didn't, I didn't take or keep track of the time on that, but I know it was the last, maybe even the last ten minutes of the of the audio. Two thirty-nine, correct. And of course, just to even though you've already stated, but uh, we object still to the predicate number one, uh, and then we would object object on specifically relevance. on the predicate. Tell me which what what part of the predi that, predicate? Uh, this witness can still not identify the voice of Daniela. First, she said it was the wife and the mother, and now we know it's both the the wife. Uh, so well, I, don't I don't know, know what, where the confusion uh, well, well, was. Uh, uh, I think the, the state also said that, and I know there was reference to a prior conversation. Uh, from what I remember hearing on, on two thirty eight was your client saying they're basing this on an old conversation I had with my mom. So, so again, I don't know if that's what the confusion was initially, but uh, they can ask the witness again whether or not, I, I, I thought it was clarified that this, both 238 and 239, were a conversation with Daniela Ortiz, who is um, your client's wife. And they, they verified it by saying the phone number matched, uh, I won't repeat the number now, but the... the, the you know, the, the witness testified that one, one of the exhibits was with the mother. That's, that's why I asked her, do you know her mother, his mother's voice? I just didn't know what the confusion was. But, yeah. but it's been cleared up, Your Honor. But we would still object that she cannot, from her personal knowledge, identify the voice of Daniela Ortiz. And so lack of personal knowledge, uh, so we're attacking the predicate. That's one, Your Honor. The second one is relevance, and you've already pretty much addressed. But I do want to clear something up that uh, even on the motion to suppress discussion that he's saying that his lawyer uh, uh, he's concerned about the, uh, the statement and his lawyer's going to uh, do that in November of, of 2018 we were not his lawyers your honor and there's a lot of discussion also about that the lawyer uh, was going to needs more money for experts and he's going to make more money if he gets charged with capital murder we were not his lawyers I got appointed in December of 2018, and I believe Mr. Fuchs got appointed in January of 2019. So all these discussions about lawyers is not us. It's his prior lawyer that the court had appointed. Uh, and so... Uh, I, I, I didn't make re uh, any reference as to who the lawyers were uh, in my comments right now. Uh, well, certain, I want to make sure that... Certainly my, my, my uh, recollection, yes, you were appointed by the court once it, it was a capital case. Because yes, of, once it became because, a capital because case. Because you were on the, uh, on the capital list. Uh, yes. But we agree with the court that everything on 239 is not relevant. And we would even argue that him telling his attorney at the time that he's concerned about the statement and to file a motion to suppress... That's in November the 6th of 2018, uh, which is approximately a month and a half after September the 15th of 2018. So if they're offering it to show at guilt innocence, Your Honor, with this cause of action, which is his guilt or innocence, his state of mind, even that statement on November the 6th of 2018, is not relevant. Because our whole, whatever we've talked about his state of mind, has to do with him taking pills and drinking. Now, unless they're going to introduce evidence that at the Webb County Jail he's taking pills and drinking, then maybe it's relevant. But absent that, what does it matter what his state of mind was well, on? Well, well what I'm, what I'm, if, unless I'm missing this, what I'm understanding the relevance being here is that here we are, like you just said, months later, he's still remembering what he said at the time uh, of, of the, time, the time in question. So there's no and the issue about blackouts and all the all these issues that were brought up. Well, but the blackouts earlier during the were argument. addressed with pills and drinking. That that's where the blackouts discussion comes from, pills and drinking. Yes, and, but 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 again, going back to the okay, so the whole issue about voluntariness that was yes, brought up, whether or not he was aware of what he was saying at the time, and here we are two months later during this phone call, and he's saying, I remember giving details I'm concerned about that. That's what I'm understanding the relevance argument to be. Not about his state of mind two months later, but the fact that he's re going back and saying, I remember what I said back in September, and I'm concerned about that, because I gave a lot of detail. That's, okay. that's, that's what, I, what I'm hearing as far as relevance. Well, I, 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 would, I would argue that it's not relevant, Your Honor, because at the time that he's giving the statements, he is drinking and taking pills. But regardless, I would argue that it's not relevant. If it is relevant, uh, it, it 
uh, its probative value is outweighed by its unfair prejudice. It's a confusion of the issues because now he's in custody and it's uh, introduced only to inflame the minds of the jurors, Your Honor. And, and so, and I'll come, I'll come back to 239, but at 238 again, uh, Mr. Alaniz, you mentioned at the beginning that he was comparing this case to Casey, the Casey uh, Anthony case based on a book he was reading. I think all the reference was the way, according to, to, to the audio, to your, 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 your client's voice, was the way the sheriff's office was handling it, the way the DA's office was handling it, uh, m mentioning things that he thought were similar, uh, even some, something about going to the, to the medical and then being interviewed. Um, I, I don't know how that would be relevant. I know that there was some mention by, uh, uh, that I heard on the audio um, that, that the police wanted him to do something so that they can, I guess, respond, I guess, insinuating shoot, shoot at him or, or, or do something to that effect. Uh, he was questioning, he said, he was going back to, to that scene saying, I, I said, I'm not resisting, I'm not resisting. Uh, something about him reading an article that said that if they saw him walking out of the store unarmed and, and that um, that's why they used the tasers, but yet he was making reference yet they were actually pointing at me with guns and rifles and all that. So I don't know what the relevant or which part you're, you're saying is relevant in this CD, Mr. Alanis. Let me hear from you again because it's not all, there's a lot that I don't think is relevant, but. Okay, Maybe so what the argument. state is, uh, what the state considers uh, relevant is the issue that was brought up during opening <coughs> statements by Mr. Perez that uh, he was a broken man at the time, he was suicidal. Uh, at 1445 of this phone call, he says, I'm not suicidal, I've never been suicidal for the record, who's ever listening, I'm not suicidal, never agreed with being put in isolation for, for suicidal. At 2250, he says, I clarify, I'm not suicidal, never been suicidal. Um, so when somebody comes in to the jail uh, under this type of situation, they put him in, in, in solitary. Uh, he's going back referencing that, uh, that he was never suicidal. But, 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 th but this, this would be on July, July 10, 2020. Correct. So it's two years. It's two after. years removed. Uh, our, our, our argument is that he makes reference to going back to the offense saying that when it was a lie that um, because uh, our interpretation was that by pulling out the that by pulling out the phone if he in fact wanted to commit suicide by cop uh, him pulling out the phone he would have gotten shot uh, so uh, he never did that he makes reference to again uh, at the time of his arrest uh, uh, situations that occurred during during that time that he could have, in fact, committed uh, suicide opportunities, that he could have jumped off the fourth floor of the, of the parking uh, garage or engaged the police officers and gotten shot. Our take on, on this, this phone call is that he's, he's making the statement that he was not suicidal, that he's never been suicidal even throughout the, the night or the morning of September the 15th of, 20, of 2018. Well, he didn't say that. I think two years later, he even talks, oh, these are the guys, they said something about suicide and they placed him in isolation. I don't want to go to isolation. So he's saying to whoever's listening, in the context of being incarcerated, I'm not suicidal. I've never been suicidal. Yeah, and that, that's what I, I mean. I also heard something about there's a third, I, won't, I don't know if I remember hearing the name, but it was about a third female saying something that she was speaking to the defendant because she feared for his life, I guess, yes, thinking, thinking that he was suicidal. And, and, then, so and, then, and then after that is when he said, that, that he's not because yeah. everything was in the context of like almost like he's saying I don't want to go into isolation I'm not suicidal it's in the context of incarceration and so therefore uh, we don't think it's admissible you know uh, there, there, there's also a lot of Spanish uh, interjected in here Mr. Alanis throughout I don't obviously we don't have a translation I imagine well th th that was I have written here Spanish on both of them there's a lot of Spanish around. and yes. so I mean just because some of us are bilingual and we understand it, but we can't, you know, we would have to translate everything. And so, but it, our objection again is it's the entirety of 238, it's not relevant. If it is relevant, its probative value is outweighed by its unfair prejudice, the confusion of the issues, or it's a, designed to inflame the minds of the jury. Of course, respectfully, we disagree with the counsel. We believe that is relevant and will, it goes to the issues before the jury, uh, and we can redact those portions that are not uh, relevant 
uh, the, the conversations with the children. We can also uh, focus in 239 on his uh, statements regarding the voluntariness of the confession that he was concerned about the statements he made, uh, and that starts at uh, 2030, um, that we're all on the same page. And then on 238, again, we, we were seeking to introduce the portions that he makes reference to not being suicidal uh, and everything else surrounding the events that he, he, he goes back to uh, of the night of the um, of, of the offense, of the arrest, of course. You know, the blackouts was was something that ha did become a, an issue, uh, whether it was, be, and again, it were, whether it was self-induced through the mixture of alcohol and pills, the facts have, and evidence have shown that it was basically a lie from the, from the get-go. He jumped at that opportunity. Uh, both witnesses, Calderon and Salinas testified that he was lying at the initial uh, first four or five discs of the confession, then confronted with the evidence and the facts, he admitted to the truth. He himself revealed that everything regarding the blackouts and the pills and the alcohol was a complete lie. Uh, and him talking about it two years later is even more proof and evidence okay. that his memory is intact. All right. Well, uh, I'll tell you what, on uh, Exhibit 238, I'm going to uh, sustain the objection. I don't find any relevance uh, within that uh, CD. On 239, uh, I will admit portions uh, and uh, somewhere starting where it says, if we're all on the same page, uh, I'm very concerned about the statement, uh, I wanted to suppress it, where I said what happened, something along those lines. And then, go, I guess, redact everything after that until you get to the point where, it says, where he says there is no evidence except the confession I went into detail. I don't think there's anything else that's relevant. If the defense wants to add anything uh, based on optional completeness, then you, you may request so. But I don't think there's anything that, because in between that, it's, it's, it's actually, I think, his wife saying, uh, quoting the Bible, and trying to encourage him, keep the faith, uh, God controls everything, things like that. So I don't really think it's relevant. Part of the, uh, the the statement and the motion to suppress is that what you're where he says I'm concerned about the fact that I, uh, of what I said so I want uh, yeah and what about you're, you're going to keep out and my lawyer's going to file a motion to suppress to keep it out I don't know that that needs to be added uh, that uh, if, if the court wants I don't to focus on the portion that says we're all on the same page I'm concerned about the statements that I made. Because that's the relevance that I see based on your argument and based on what maybe was said during opening. And also, uh, further down towards the end, he says there is no evidence except the confession where I went into detail. Those two things, I'll, I'll burn them. Those on are the only CD. things, and, they're all, and from what I recall, they were all in, that was all said in English, so yes. we don't need a, a translation. So we're we're going to extract, we're going we're gonna to redact everything else. And that's under 239. 238 is, is uh, excluded in its entirety. Okay. If we can have uh, 20 minutes to do that. Yes, go ahead. Good. Mr. Fetis, anything else? We're going to take a short recess, if not. <coughs> go ahead. All right. We're going to recess for about 20 minutes.
Go you ready for your co counsel? You ready? All right, let's bring the jury in, please. All right, to the jury. Maybe see it. All right. State may proceed. Before the break, uh, we were discussing states exhibit two thirty eight and two thirty nine, correct? Yes. Uh, we're going to focus on uh, states exhibit two thirty nine. Right. And what was the date of that recording? It was November seventh, two thousand and eighteen. So that was uh, just a couple uh, so close to the, the date of the offense in September of 2018, correct? Yes, sir. And uh, does and this and you listened to 239, correct? Yes, sir. And Juan David Ortiz makes a statement where he is concerned about the confession that he made. Yes. Got our permission to uh, play that portion. The, the admitted ex excerpt, yes. The ex the, that excerpt, uh, we will play that excerpt at this time. Okay. I'm very concerned over the statement that I made. Yes. And who is he telling that to? He's saying that to his wife. If you recall, uh, does he make reference to the confession one more time? Yes. And that would be towards the end of the phone call? Yes, sir. Permission to publish that second excerpt? Yes. In the, you know, evidence or whatever to turn to win capital. You know what I mean? He says, I know there is no evidence, just a confession. Yes, sir. That I made. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Uh, this was picked up while he was at Webb County Jail on November. November 7th, 2018. 2018. Okay. That's the witness, Your Honor. No question, Your Honor. Yes,
May she be excused, Your Honor? Yes, she's excused. Thank you. May we approach her? Yes. All right, does the state have any other witnesses? Your Honor, that, uh, that was the state's last witness. The state of Texas will rest. Okay, we're going to go ahead and uh, excuse the jury just for uh, a few minutes this time. Uh, take up one more matter, and uh, we'll bring you in in less than 10 minutes. I'll remind, remind you not to discuss facts in the case. All right, the jury. Yes, sir. I would like to make a motion for an instructed verdict uh, in that the state has failed to prove the indictment beyond a reasonable doubt. <clears throat> As the court is aware, we've been challenging the search of the truck, uh, and we would submit to the court that based on the evidence, the state failed to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that the search of the white dodge out of the stripes uh, was legal. Uh, it was a warrantless search and therefore illegal. And then the second search that was conducted at the uh, substation uh, at 7209 East Saunders, uh, the, the vehicle was in a secure place. There were no exigent circumstances. And uh, it was searched again, Your Honor, uh, and it was a warrantless search. And we would argue that under the Fourth Amendment or the Fourteenth Amendment, Article One of the Texas Constitution, Article Thirty-Eight Twenty-Three of the Code of Criminal Procedure, that that evidence is not admissible, and therefore all the evidence that arose from the search, in particular the firearm, and everything that comes therefrom, uh, was not proven to the court beyond a reasonable doubt. In addition, uh, we would argue to the court that with regards to the statement of the defendant that the requirements of Article 3822 uh, and, and pursuant to Miranda and its progeny that the statement was not voluntarily made in that the police officers uh, first were instructed that he did not want to give a statement when uh, Ranger E.J. Salinas inquired, 
and Mr. Ortiz said no. Uh, in addition, there was another instance where he says, you want to continue? And he, Mr. Ortiz replied, fuck no. Uh, in addition, uh, prior to any incriminating statements, uh, both Mr. Uh, Captain Calderon and also Ranger E.J. Salinas made uh, promises uh, of uh, a quid pro quo nature uh, to induce and to coerce uh, Mr. Ortiz to incriminate himself, uh, not to mention the temporal uh, issue, which is the amount of time that they held him uh, with merely providing him water and some chips. And so we would argue that uh, any and all statements made by the defendant uh, were not proven uh, voluntarily made uh, beyond a reasonable doubt to the court, and therefore any evidence that arose from the statements uh, and the statement itself of Mr. Ortiz uh, was not admissible. And for those reasons, we would submit to the court that the, the state has failed to prove the indictment beyond a reasonable doubt. Thank you. you may I respond, Your Honor? You may. Uh, uh, I will address first the, the evidence in this case. There is a mountain, an overwhelming amount of evidence to prove Mr. Juan David Ortiz's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt, and that any jury, any reason, reasonable jury here in Bear County or in Webb County or any county in the state of Texas has enough evidence to meet that burden. Regarding the search and the confession, these issues have been extensively examined and visited by the court in its two prior rulings. The evidence that was developed during this trial over the course of the last week and uh, two days only strengthened the evidence on the legality and constitutionality of both the search of the vehicle and the confession. The facts and evidence that were elicited during the trial establish that Mr. Juan David Ortiz did not have a reasonable expectation of privacy in his truck. The evidence uh, has proven that he abandoned his vehicle during the commission of an offense and that no warrant was needed and falls under the exceptions of requiring a warrant. The subsequent search that was conducted at the substation is therefore legal and the gun and everything else that was found in the vehicle is legal. With respect to the confession given by Mr. Juan David Ortiz, there's been extensive and overwhelming amount of evidence that has been brought out through the witnesses, through the video, that prove that Mr. Ortiz's confession was made knowingly and made voluntarily without coercion, without promise, without guarantee, without inducement, and that he was read his rights in the totality of the circumstances, you, we also know that he himself is a law enforcement officer, uh, veteran officer, uh, well versed in the constitutional rights of those that are accused. And there was never any request to stop the interview or a request to invoke his right to an attorney. Everything that Mr. Juan David Ortiz said in his confession was obtained legally by both Ranger E.J. Salinas and Captain Fred Calderon. Thank you. All right. well, the court was reviewing its findings of facts and conclusions of law regarding the, both the, the uh, warrantless search that was um, argued by the defense and the uh, the issue of voluntariness during the statements and confession that the defendant made. And uh, at, at this time, after after listening to additional evidence throughout the trial uh, and the prior uh, testimony and evidence presented at the two prior hearings, uh, the court will reaffirm its, uh, it ruling, its rulings uh, from July 10th of 2020 and from September 27th of 2022. And the court will further adopt uh, the court's findings uh, made on uh, July 10th of 2020. 
And so the motion for instructive verdict at this time is denied. Ready for the jury? Right, bring the jury back in, please. All rise for the jury. Maybe see it. All right. So the state has rested its its uh, its case. Um, Mr. Pettis, what says the defense? Yes, Your Honor. The defense rests, Your Honor. Okay. Stay close. Stay close, Your Honor. Defense closed. Defense closed. Okay. You may be seated. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, all of the evidence has been presented in this case. Uh, I still need to read the jury instructions to you. We're going to have a, a conference on that with the attorneys. And what we're going to do at this time is excuse you for the day so that we can work on that. Uh, I will ask that you be back at 8.30. Uh, actually, I'll be back by 9 a.m. tomorrow. Be back at 9 a.m. Um, so that we can make sure and have that the jury instructions ready for you by then. Uh, of course, I'm going to remind you of the previous instructions I've given to you. If you're under the same instructions, I'll remind you not to discuss, not to discuss the, facts, the facts of the case, not to watch any news accounts or read any newspaper or any articles from, from any source uh, regarding this case. Okay? Uh, so we'll see you here at uh, 9 a.m. tomorrow. Uh, you're excused for the day. Thank you. All right, thank you. So we'll have a conference on the charge in a few minutes, and uh, we'll be in recess until 9 a.m. for be ready for closing arguments tomorrow morning. Cool. Courts in recess for now, but we might have to put them down.